All right, hello world. This is CS50 Live, where we do a bunch of programming from scratch, talk about technology, we do all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, CS50 is Harvard's Intro to Computer Science, if you're not familiar. Um, and you can find all of our videos and stuff on youtube.com slash CS50. So go ahead and check that out. Um, but today, so my name is Colton Ogden, uh, and I sort of host this situation here. But today we have uh, CS50's Nick Wong Hello. here, and uh, I'll let Nick take it away. What are we talking yeah. about today? So we're continuing our kind of series on uh, neural networks. I saw in the chat people were asking, you know, is linear algebra needed, like required for neural networks? And uh, I think you can actually attest to the fact that in order to get them working, not really, right? Uh, I, oh, Colton yeah, was doing absolutely. some experimenting over the yeah. weekend. Um, <laughs> and I think very... he, uh, <laughs> he did all sorts of cool things. Um, and actually, I'll ask you to talk about that a little bit in a sec. But uh, to get them working to like run neural networks, to follow a tutorial online, I'd say no, you don't really need neuro, uh, linear algebra. You do need neural nets to use neural nets. <laughs> uh, I'm a little sleepy today. But uh, yeah, I would say that you don't necessarily need it in order to get them to work in a very kind of technical sense of the question. But I think that understanding some kind of fundamentals of linear algebra, as, as was suggested in the chat, is super useful for actually doing meaningful things with neural networks. So if you want to answer your questions about why your neural net has just noise showing up every time you ask it to display an image, or if you want to understand why certain layers don't fit together, or you need some sort of um, adjustment, uh, or you're training some GAN, a uh, generative adversarial network, and you want to know, you know why are your images looking one way versus another, then linear algebra is pretty helpful. Um, so, what what did you find uh, over the weekend, Colton? Uh, you, like, I did find at? a lot of noise. <laughs> yeah. um, so I don't know if we want to do like a switcheroo of the laptop, or if we want to oh, yeah, if we want to right. um, yeah before we actually cut to go. to the to the full view. <laughs> now I don't know that much at all about uh, general generative adversarial networks or neural networks, at least in terms of the math. I know how they sort of work in principle. Um, but I was I, I am into game development, and there's a sort of appeal to me about generative art, mm. right? Like sprite art. What does that mean? What so, is uh, generative art? Generative art would be instead of an artist, uh, let's say you and I are working on a game, you're right. the programmer, you're the artist, and <laughs> I want a hundred weapons in my game. It's a lot. That's a lot of to, weapons. Uh, you're gonna have to create every single one of those. I can weapons. barely draw like one <laughs> one sword, maybe. You yeah. Know, like a little... And you have to like <laughs> creatively think of all of the sort of differences between the weapons. You right. Know, what oh, that man. means. Oh, it's a huge. Pain. So there's a creative <laughs> there's a creative cost. There's a labor cost. Yep. A time cost that takes you away from doing other things that I might need you on. True. Um, maybe you're also a programmer. Like maybe you could help. Yeah. yeah. You <laughs> <can do trees. laughs> Sorry. We're very different. Yeah. yeah. I could also <laughs> program. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure you're talking about. Oh, oh, drawing Trees. Yeah, I was like, I can also draw the trees and maybe like the shields. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I thought you were referring to like point. cutting down trees. I was like, could also do that. <laughs> uh, gardening work. I brought firewood to keep you warm while you program. <laughs> but uh, but generative spider is really cool um, because it takes away the cost of doing art as a human, which is a very slow process. Even if no. you're a good artist, it's time consuming to make really good artwork, and so. I've always been interested in the appeal of potentially finding a holy grail of generative artwork. And um, generative adversarial networks are pretty cool. People have done a lot of interesting things with them. Um, there was a article on Medium that I read about generative artwork. And I might yeah. even be able to actually find the article. So Medium, Sweet. Sprite, Art, Neural, well, Network. Well, while you're looking at that, uh, generative networks are super useful because they generate these very sharp images. Um, they can be used to generate things that look maybe even realistic, photorealistic, um, which is crazy because a lot of these like uh, variational autoencoders or kind of like random variant generators are, they generate like kind of pixelated images sometimes, or like if you're given an actual image, there's just too much complexity in like a human face or something like that for you to build something that looks realistic based even on something that's realistic. But these uh, GANs, they have the ability to kind of uh, question each other as you go. Yeah, no, it's super cool. Um, the, the article that inspired this, and I don't know how I actually ended up reading <laughs> this, was uh, it's called Machine Learning is Fun Part 7, Abusing Generative Adversarial Networks to Make 8-Bit Pixel Art. Oh, and I was like, I'm somebody who's interested <laughs> yeah, in 8-Bit Pixel, 8 -bit pixel Art. <laughs> uh, I'm also interested in generative stuff. Yep, so, 
There, this article kind of goes into detail about, you know, gener uh, it references a, a paper on this thing called a DC GAN, um, which actually, what was, what did DC stand for? I'm trying to remember what that question. actually stood for. Um, uh, oh, deep convolutional. Ah, there right, you go. Yeah, of course. That makes sense. <laughs> um, but a, the the end goal of this article was to actually create pixel art that looked like this, and the sprites themselves aren't actually generated, but the, the all the tiles in this, the uh, everything but. Simon here, this monster, and this bat is all generated from a neural network. That's cool. And this was done with basically, they, they went into detail on how they did it, but down here, if we scroll just a little bit, and they go into obviously the details on how yeah. a, a uh, generative adversarial network works and all that stuff, um, which we'll actually end up getting to, if not this one, but like one of the future streams. One of our streams, next streams will yeah, eventually that'll be, be a, that. A, on generative Somewhere adversarial there. networks. <laughs> but, um, Basically, they took, I think, 10,000 screenshots of NES games, like all of these ones here, wow. piped them into a, a, a neural network, and you can actually find the GitHub repo. Uh, you can find the repo on GitHub, and I actually used it myself. Um, but it ended up creating things that look like this. So pretty <laughs> pretty chaotic. Yeah, a little wild. And, it, and you know, you've talked about overfitting data. It does overfit in a lot of situations. You can see, like, direct copy and paste of certain menus mm. and things like that in some of the screenshots. But it definitely grabbed patterns, which is nice. It yeah. also grabbed a lot of noise. Oh um. yeah, I feel, I feel like that's a uh, I that's feel like that's an inevitability. Yep. But they they ended up creating stuff that looked like this, which is pretty cool. So getting pretty close, yep. and they they basically just took a bunch of tiles here from some of that work that they did, yeah. and then made a <laughs> made a, a level out of it. And what I wanted to end up doing myself was something very similar. So what I did was I grabbed some artwork, for example, from the um, Dungeon Crawler Stone Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup game. <laughs> Which, if we go to Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup Tile, I looked. At, I was looking for the sliced tile set. Um, <laughs> where is it? Here. OpenGameArt.org has it. They're 32 by 32 tiles. And uh, I apologize for anybody who is eager to get into like the TensorFlow part of this talk. Yeah. Oh but, yeah, uh, no, it's all good. We got this is we a, two uh, hours. <laughs> basically a, a massive tile set for this game called Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. It's a roguelike game. There's a ton <laughs> of like you know weapons and enemies and items and all sorts of things. Yeah. Perfect for this use case. These are 32 by 32 nice. pixel tiles, right? And what I did was I grabbed that artwork. I took, I did a bunch of experiments, but we'll just talk about my most recent one. I took all of the, um, where is it? It's in data, it's in the weapons. I took all the weapons. So everything that looks like this, basically, you can see axes, maces, swords, sides, <laughs> all, all sorts of fun stuff. But there's a lot of patterns. We were talking about this in yeah, advance, yeah. right? They all kind of angle up and to the right. There's uh, some weights as to like what's at the top of that versus the bottom of it in a lot of cases. Right. A lot of color variants. Um, and I, I ran the network on this for uh, 20 epics, which is just like a, a training period, sort of like yeah. an interval of time. And uh, what ended up coming out of that at the very end was stuff that looked kind of like <laughs> this. So you can see there's like kind of a sword, like it looks like this. a Halo weapon set. Yeah, you know, like, kind of like a Halo weapon set. Yeah, this yeah, is only yeah, after 20 sword. epics, right? Which so is very a short, <laughs> pretty, pretty small period and of time. And on a CPU, on a laptop, and you know we're, we're doing a lot of things that are kind of what people would be like, oh, there's no way that would work at all. But it, it very clearly gets a lot of the patterns that you're looking for, where it gets the main one. Uh, everything's angled up and to the right. <laughs> um, it also gets that there's all these different colors that belong, and there's I think there were a couple images when we were looking at it before the stream that had kind of like a clear color gradient. Uh, like a lot of weapons will have like a darker portion at the bottom and then lighter at the top because metals are often reflective and woods and like plastics and things are not. Um, and it's kind of amazing, I think to me, that it's even capturing any patterns uh, in a very short period of time. It's very cool. Yeah, <laughs> no, it was, it was super awesome. And uh, this is motivating me. And I think the ultimate way we ended up getting to this sort of roundabout <laughs> was that the math is super important yeah. because I do not know what I need to change about this to get it to produce the things that I want. Right. So working from a top-down <laughs> approach, I now have a motivation to actually <laughs> dig into the internals of this and figure out how all, all of these pieces end up um, working together. Now somebody asked for the um, link to the article and to the uh, repo, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Let me just find those really quick. Sure. In the meantime, if you I'll want, I'll uh, give you the, the cable here. We can cool. switch over to your computer. And uh, I'll let you take it away. That was a big spiel cool. on my part, yeah, so no, I apologize. Awesome. It's fun. It's interesting <laughs> stuff. But um, let's uh, let's get to the actual, I guess, talk of, or heart. Yeah, I mean, this is still part today. of uh, pretty much all under the same set of ideas where we're trying to take in images. Images are tricky. They're... Um, they're, I think, particularly interesting to humans because we can see them. We look at them all the time, our entire world. Uh, this assumes kind of privileged-wise uh, that we can see. Uh, so my apologies if that's not for you. 
Um, but generally speaking, uh, <laughs> well, there is like, generative <laughs> sound, right? And you, that was kind of the other point. And someone mentioned in the chat was like, have it sample rock songs and generate music. Is really these are all just different forms of data, right? Uh, an image, a sound wave, they're all just different kinds of data, um, and you can essentially represent them within these matrices uh, in. Uh, pretty much the same way. Now, a lot of work has been done on developing kind of these generative models for images that kind of recognizes that in, in the way that like sound and uh, sequences of numbers are kind of linearly dependent, right? So, and a lot of times they make this like Markov assumption where any pixel that I'm currently at only depends on the pixel before it. Um, but that's not necessarily true in an image where the things around it actually kind of shape what's going on. And you can actually generalize that kind of Markovian assumption to being like, well, at any pixel here, only the pixels that came kind of before it, top, down, left, right kind of style, mattered. And so this is still kind of that same assumption, but it works a little bit better for images where you're actually taking like all three things before it instead of just the one. That's um, kind of like um, kind of like how like image filtering is, like yeah, interpolation. Exactly, like, where we're kind of just like filtering down diagonally rather than... And you sample around a, a pixel too when you want right. to actually interpolate it. And try and figure it. out what's in there. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of a little bit clearer idea. Um, it works a little bit better for what we know to be true with how images often are. Um, but even that has its own issues. Um, there are some pretty intricate complexities with how images form, and we're not entirely sure of how they work um, in terms of like how do I want to model an image for a computer. Um, so images are really interesting to humans. Uh, so are sounds. And sounds are a little bit less uh, kind of popular, I guess, um, just by nature of people are really interested in how do you change images around. Well, there's but, this really cool um, generative music thing that I saw. Right. And they're still around. Like, it's not like people haven't researched it. It still exists. Actually, um, I'm going to try to find a link to that while you while And you they do all going. sorts of cool things. There's, you can go as simple as just kind of taking the fundamentals, um, the primitives of music theory, and saying, well, we have you know, x number of notes. We have x number of rhythms. And how do I recombine those to get things to work? There's kind of this like learned, almost natural language processing style way of doing things, where you take a bunch of music that has existed, but you have its primitives. So you have like what it looks like in maybe like a MIDI file or an XML file and you then try and iterate over that. And then you have this kind of like raw sound wave, given a set of amplitudes, can I sample from that and figure out what's going on um, from there? And so there's many different ways of kind of approaching each kind of data. Um, so we're gonna focus a lot on images, but sound is also super interesting. There's all different ways to represent different kinds of data, and there's all different kinds of data, and like it's an enormous field uh, for that reason. It's being used in all sorts of things, can from like genetic, uh, sorry, genetics and sequences of DNA and genetic material to like protein construction. So that's all very bio-heavy, all the way through to like how do I predict how like a city's traffic map will look? What does a city heat map look like from the top down? How do I organize things uh, for navigational purposes? All the way over to like how do I generate art? Um, there's a generative artwork. That that sold for some ridiculous amount of money a little while ago, um, and that's kind of cool. It's you know, is that do, do we replace artists by doing that? And I'm sure people would argue, well, no, of course not. But realistically, if I can generate something and you can't tell whether it was me or um, a machine, then maybe effectively I can, right? And there's all these kind of weird problems with it. Um, so it, there's just so many different like ways and kind of paths you can take down each of these that. Even in our three streams, where we've taken like a collective six hours to discuss like one very particular image set and what we can do with it, we still have not even covered like not like not even a small amount. We've covered a very very minor amount that's almost negligible I relative to the actual. Way, just oh yeah, bit. sorry, I'll scoot over a little. Your arm keeps getting there we cut go. Yeah, I keep yeah very talkative with my hands. So all gesticulations. Sorts of things. Yeah, all over the place. I for so, some reason can't find the the, the <laughs> medium article that did the had some really cool generative music on it. But if I find it, if you do, I will post, post it, it in there. the chat for sure. <laughs> exactly. Um, um, okay, and I think uh, someone at the end asked, "Can you tell me what the difference between an MLP, multilayer perceptron, and a deep neural net um, is?" And they said that they're the same. Am I right? Um, so said that they're the same is kind of like saying squares or rectangles. Like it's it's not necessarily that they are the same so much as like a deep neural network is kind of a generalized form of how you would. Uh, it, it can be used for many things, from like classification to prediction on uh, what will come next and things like that. Um, deep neural nets are a very wide, oh, relatively wide. Uh, range of things. A multilayer perceptron is a form of neural net that 
uses particular types of layers within it. So it has a very particular dense layer and it has a very particular like mathematical formula behind it. It's kind of like a class um, versus instance relationship. Yeah, very much this it kind of is a relationship. Subset. I'll switch um, to that. Just and so we have our classic screensaver back there. Very pretty colors. Um, so uh, Blue Booger says squares and rectangles are kind of the same. What kind of magic is that? Um, well, squares are all rectangles, but uh, not all rectangles are squares, right? So a square is defined by having like its width and height be the same, but a rectangle can have any arbitrary set of width and height. Um, and that's really just kind of the essence of the definition difference. The similarity occurs where they're composed, they're polygons, um, four-sided polygons with 90 degree angles um, at every intersection between their sides. So basically the idea is just like, I think when I was a kid, someone was like, oh, all squares are rectangles, not all rectangles are squares. And I was like, whoa, that's wild. And I use that in kind of anytime this sort of uh, relationship of like superset subset comes up or uh, kind of instance in class as P Colton put it. Um, it's a pretty common like pattern and phenomenon that shows up in the world, sometimes less intuitively than others. Um, it's often, you can often relate that in general to like causation and association, right? Like I associate maybe um, squares with rectangles, but just having the cause be a rectangle does not create a square um, and so on. So there's all, it's like a very, the more abstract you go, the more interesting that pattern gets, but it shows up all the time. Um, and people often confuse one for the other, and it's, you know, it's an interesting thing to talk about. So uh, Babic Knight asked, you know, how much computation theory do we need to go into ML and AI? Um, I think for this, we're actually, we've kind of worked our way from the bottom up, so we're, kind of, we're actually going to talk quite a bit about just kind of like higher level things in this one. Um, I actually probably won't code a whole lot today. I'm a little tired. Didn't have quite enough time for myself to prep. Um, sorry, I was doing a lot of P sets, so that's an excuse for you guys, but uh, <laughs> that is essentially what's going on here. It's hard being um, a Harvard student. Yeah, so there's a lot, of, a lot of work going on, and I just, you know, there are other things that kind of took priority, but we will still code a little bit, uh, at least to just kind of get people introduced to TensorFlow. Probably not like a huge amount of coding on my part, and then we'll talk about some of the things that I found um, useful when I was trying to understand how this whole like style transfer concept works. And that's ultimately what we want to do today, right? Yes. It's, yeah. It's so at the end of today, transfer. we want to figure out how um, this sort of thing works, and I figure we'll start with it, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Oh, well, they have messy... a nice website that does it for you. Yes, too. they do have a nice website. This is called DeepArt.io. Feel free to hop by if you'd like. Um, this is. Do, 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 do. I think there was a really good one in like the Cali stream where we both look kind of not horrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's this image from us. Um, it, oh, that might be broken, but that's okay. Um, and we're gonna just kind of pick a neat style that we think would be oh, appropriate. Oh, that was cool. Very like minimalist, like yeah, kinda, wide strokes. Yeah, kind of nifty, you know. Uh, we might have to put like an actual email in here. So interesting. Yeah, we'll kind of put that over here. See what goes on. <laughs> They're gonna steal all your information. Yep, everyone's gonna hijack my emails now. Uh, your image will be done in around ten minutes. Cool. Wow. That takes a long time then. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty complex process that's going on. Although we can make our own version of it that's not nearly as terrible. Um, <laughs> but you know, we'll uh, we'll let this kind of run, and I'll check my email in you know, ten, 10 minutes, minutes or so. Set a timer. Um, yeah, and we'll see what goes on. But if you wanted to see kind of a preview transfer. Image style transfer. Uh, we want to go to images, and wow, this is not quite what I was expecting. Ah, here Google you go. images a, has changed their yeah, interface well, a little bit. Yeah, well, this is DuckDuckGo's images. Um, so oh, I, would, I see. You're not even. I would explain <laughs> why it's a little, little distinct. Okay, so we have these kind of two examples, and there's a paper I'll pull up later that uh, shows off what's going on. Oh, that's so uh, cool. Yeah, it's super nifty. So this image, you actually can't really distinguish the fact that it's been altered. This one's a little bit easier to see that it's been changed. Um, but this one, not so much. And there's a lot of really cool examples on how this works. Wow. Um, essentially, this is my content image, so this is what I want to see. Same thing over here. Um, but this is my style image. So my style is kind of like, how do I want it to look? What kind of texture, what kind of um, attributes do I want to have on the content? That's so crazy, because um, uh, it's like is. finding the outlines of the buildings, applying things oh, yeah. to them, like putting the sky behind the buildings. Yep. It's wild. Uh, a human insane. could not do this super and easily. And the clouds don't even look, the, the clouds are all modified to be yep. the sick. They're the, the same one, style, but, but they don't look at all fake. Um, if you're familiar at all with deep fakes, there's kind of a similar concept going on there. Um, and it's kind of scary. Like, I mean, as someone who's interested in security, this is terrifying to me. Uh, people can forge things that even I would struggle to uh, tell apart, especially because only given this, I may not be able to tell you 
where, like which thing it was faked from with, uh, how it worked. I might not even be able to notice that this isn't real. Granted, these um, uh, this might not apply too well to like two pictures that are very different ter like, domains. Like if you try to take that first top left image and then mix it with the, that middle bo like this bottom one, here. that might not turn out so nice. It's a little less clean. Um, it would be definitely worth trying on your own. Um, but this is maybe a recognizable image uh, with a pretty clear, you know, who styled yeah, that it. That looks like 100% um, painted. It's yep, crazy. Which is kind of the wild part. And here's some kind of other examples. I mean, it's definitely worth Googling around to kind of see what exactly happened. Um, but I think that it's mind boggling. I, I really love these like photorealistic ones. I think they're the ones that just blow my mind entirely. Um, but being able to transfer style is something that I think is a little wild. It's not something that's intuitive um, in terms of like how it actually works. So there's a paper that was written on this, um, and the paper is Image Style Transfer Using Convolutional Neural Networks. Um, and if you remember from our last stream, uh, one of the reasons that we talked about using convolutional neural networks is we want to use these convolutional layers to learn features um, from an image. So if I have an image of our faces, then one of the important features from our faces might be our faces themselves. <laughs> um, it might literally be, you know, what, where, what arrangement of eyes, mouth, and nose make us more or less distinct. Um, but when I say like a feature of some image, I certainly do not mean learning the image itself, which is something that neural networks can have a problem with um, in a form of overfitting where we end up actually just grabbing the face, um, in which case it's pretty clear which one's which, but it's not general, right? Like to distinguish between ours is easy, but to generate one of us from the other one is difficult. Ties if you've into overfit. a Blue Booger's comment about, it's just like <laughs> when I paste a picture of my head on a picture of the rock. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, and in kind of the way of like, that's the idea, but when you do something like that, it's easy for us to tell. Whereas <laughs> the... Uh, hey, you don't know. You don't know what it looks like. Yeah, maybe you're very good at Photoshop. Um, but with a neural net, I can do that to anything as a very general sense. Um, Bobby Knight says, so if we learn this, we can basically be Well, painters. that's the whole point. Um, that's kind of the like, concept. That's why, yeah. <laughs> that's why, like, for example, I want to be able to generate sprite art. Right. I right. don't want to spend <laughs> millions of hours making millions of you know, sprites. True. Well, and with something like this, you know, there's already a lot of natural variation in people, and there are many data sets that contain people, um, and you could actually take the sprite art style and apply it to real people. That's true. And it would essentially do the same thing without you having to generate any of the variants. Make a neural um, net that fits Colton's hair seamlessly onto every <laughs> CS50 student? Wow. That's a, that's that'd, an, that's that'd a project. That'd be kind of wild. Um, <laughs> very, probably doable. Um, very <laughs> wild. So essentially, yeah, I'd recommend going and reading this paper. It's not too terrible mathematically. They go into a little bit of math, uh, which we'll kind of break down throughout this stream. But uh, it's, they have a lot of like helpful graphics on understanding just exactly what's going on here. And I'm going to pick one to show you. Um, but here's another set of examples of here's the reference image. And then there are several different style images that are applied. Um, I think this one's pretty nifty. Uh, this one looks like someone took acid. Uh, but this one I think is particularly interesting where um, you essentially just have kind of this like weird kind of block style art, um, but I can still tell what the original image was. Do you uh, guys know if these wild. are similar techniques to the ones used to generate the image of the black hole? I actually don't know anything <laughs> about that. Do you? Do you yeah, know? so they're actually not really at all uh, similar to those techniques. Those techniques were pretty awesome. Uh, the team that built the things that generated the image of a black hole was not just one team, it was several teams that kind of collaborated and worked together um, and really kind of just a awesome achievement and feat of, uh, of science, I think. Um, I, I was awed by that image and also just like the amount of work that went into it. Um, the woman who was credited with kind of being at the head of that is brilliant and amazing and also near here. She works at Harvard, which is awesome, or at least at a Harvard affiliate. And I don't know, I was just, the, the whole team was awesome and clearly no one person could have done all of that, but they're, it's so cool, uh, just super interesting. Uh, I would recommend going and reading the article on how they did that. There was a lot of work done on kind of like inferring what it must look like for us um, because there are kind of problems with the standard uh, way of visualizing a black hole or visualizing things where we generally visualize them by bouncing beams like photons off of them and seeing what energy comes back to us. But um, the issue with a black hole is that those photons just don't come back. Um, so it makes it very difficult to figure out, you know, what exactly it looks like, um, kind of an ultimate form of darkness, but there is this kind of wild uh, image that was generated basically by saying, 
um, what they were able to grab from inferring from like radio frequencies and other kind of just incredibly large amounts of data. Um, there's someone that says the black hole pick was a waste of time and told us nothing we did not already know. Um, I almost could not more strongly disagree with every part of that sentence. Um, if you, I mean, yeah, I, I very, very thoroughly disagree with that. Um, just based on the idea that even if you <laughs> um, it suggests that you know the pictures are nothing reasonable, then the like terabytes of information that they were able to process and do so in such a cohesive and reasonable fashion with such a low error rate and such kind of ridiculously controlled variants um, is, I think, impressive in and of itself. Uh, even like the collaboration between the teams is uh, impressive in and of itself. And the JP guy says, I think he was being ironic, and I could concede that that is likely uh, that. But um, what I kind of, my point there is that there's a lot of kind of controversy going on with the black hole picture where people are kind of harassing and going after the scientists involved and kind of spreading some misinformation about how it works or what went on behind it or who coded what. And so my point is simply to support uh, the scientists and the team behind that because they did something incredible. Uh, so I think in this case it's actually worth not uh, necessarily chancing spreading any sort of misinformation on that. Um, so yeah, that's my opinion on that. Um, but it's super interesting and would definitely recommend go looking up, uh, just go see what's going on behind that. Um, yeah, so now we're back to kind of our a little bit less, uh, I guess, celestial, if you will, um, image generators and kind of how do we transfer a style from one image to the next. And I think this picture does a really good job of explaining what exactly is going on. So as kind of a recap, um, we have these convolutional neural networks. And so convolutions are just a way of processing an image and trying to figure out what things or features from the image um, exist and are important. Um, now, important is something that we'll go back to later because it'll matter how we actually get this to work, um, but importance is something that's really difficult to dictate. If you say, uh, how do I want to quantify what's important to me, it's fairly difficult to do mathematically, and there are these tricks, these loss functions that we create that do exactly that. Um, so if you look at what's going on here, we have some style image up at the top, we have our input content image at the bottom, and somehow at the very end here, we end up with some form of modified image. Um, and so essentially what's going on is you have some convolutional neural network that knows what features are important. So it's fairly common for, at least in the tutorials that are kind of around up there, um, to use a pre-changed network that has already learned for classification purposes what features are valuable. Um, are there a lot of circles in this image? Are there a lot of slanted lines? Do they slant to the right or the left? Things like that. So like VGG16 is a 16 layer convolutional neural network that's often used for ca uh, classifying things. Um, there are many online. You can go into like the Keras applications folder and it has a ton. Um, but these pre-trained networks, uh, you don't have to train them yourself and that would be kind of ridiculous on a laptop, but they come pre-trained and they have already learned uh, what are called like the feature representations that are valuable in an image. So given any two images, it can, once that image is passed through the neural network, it can tell you, hey, here are the things from that image that according to what I know is important um, are in it or not. Um, and that's essentially what you're seeing here is um, what things up on the top, what stylistic things are important from this image, and up at the bottom, or sorry, down at the bottom, what content things are important from the image. So there is kind of this uh, idea in order to transfer style over is how much do I want to understand from each image is style, and how much do I want to understand is content. And that's, that's pretty tricky. Um, so generally what ends up happening, and they, I think, they do a pretty good job here of uh, showing that as you reconstruct the images, as you go further or deeper into the neural network from a convolutional neural network, if you're reconstructing the image from really deep within, um, the style is pretty much exactly retrieved, the content is a little bit muddled. If you go from the very beginning, style is still pretty much noisy, kind of like just basic colors, but the content is pretty much exact. Um, and so essentially what they want to demonstrate is if we pick from different, at, uh, different sections of the neural network, different layers, what their representations are, then we can actually try and throw these onto some other image, kind of like a template image that we use, and that template image we can then measure how well it has acquired both the style 
and the content. And so the kind of general idea is, I have three images actually, but only two of them are input by the user. My first one is my style, my second one is my content, and my third one is kind of this just random noise image. It's just like a nice little template, clean slate. Um, it's not all zero because all zero has actual significance, so we just throw in a bunch of uniform noise, or maybe even Gaussian noise, and we say, okay, given this image, I'm going to add in features from the style and from the content. I do this, and then I measure the error um, between the, this new kind of mixed image and the style, and then I also measure the error between this mixed image and the content. And what I'm trying to do, my new loss function for this neural network, is now the, error, the combined error between these two things. And I can do any, really, any kind of like adjustable um, linear combination of these two losses to get a kind of overall loss, and I want to minimize that. And the minimization of this overall loss means to us that we will have gotten as close as we can, um, kind of balanced as close as we can, between the content and the style. Um, and we just pick which layer of our pre-trained neural network or neural network that we've trained um, we want to grab these representations from in order to decide whether or not we're grabbing, excuse me, stylistic representations or content ones. Um, that's kind of the high-level overview. That's the idea. Excuse me. So this paper, I know someone asked uh, how much math would you need to know to understand this paper. Um, from my couple read-throughs, I would say not much. Um, 2,000 pages, is that what it says? <laughs> 2,400. So this is only 10 pages, um, luckily. But it was part but, of a, I guess, yeah, a larger Yeah, it was a part journal. of a journal, um, wow. which is a lot longer. That's a large. So yeah, this paper is actually fairly short. And you know, the last like three pages or so are reference, or sorry, two pages are references. So it's really only an eight page paper. Oh, that, that's the um, uh, cities, or that skyline shot looks really cool. This is super cool. Um, I really love the like blending kind of uh, nighttime images of one city with like the daytime image of another city and like seeing what happens. Really it's curious what would happen if you took away water from one of them. Right, and kind of like saw what happened across something that was maybe completely unrelated. And yeah. uh, that's the other thing is they, they tend to show off images that are like semi-related. Because right? that's where you, know? you get the best uh, fitting, I imagine. Like that's where you get Likely, just, like, the most, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's all of these things going on and then th when they start doing it with like abstract art, um, I think it's really cool, but it's then less of like a, you can tell what's going on, so much yeah. as like a, let's see what this would have looked like if so-and-so had painted it. Um, and I think that's super interesting. I also think that combining these with like a GAN or a generative adversarial network might be really interesting. Um, so can I use one of my adversarial networks, uh, maybe the generative part of it, is actually generating these kinds of images, uh, rather than like some variant on the images that is like a little bit more, uh, we'll say, constrained. Um, and then having the adversary try to figure out, uh, maybe within some set of parameters, whether or not it's faked, uh, or maybe how well can it figure out the content of the image. Um, and you can adjust your loss functions kind of just as you go, uh, or depending on what you're trying to minimize for. So generally when I talk about uh, these loss functions, what I really mean is that these neural networks are optimization problems. I'm really just trying to minimize or maximize something. Um, you'll notice that Generally speaking, a minimization is actually also a maximization. They're kind of the same idea, uh, just one's the reverse. So if I negate something that has uh, this kind of like abstractly overturned bowl shape, then it ends up being an underturned or just a normal bowl, and I can then minimize that. And generally, we just prefer to minimize. Um, that's where all the terms like gradient descent and things like that come from. We're going down a gradient. Um, there are some like little tricks where oh, it makes time to check a the email easier. too. That's a great point. I'm gonna swap off oh, and yep. hop Blue. me off of there so I can thank you. So no one can <laughs> hack into your email. Yeah, as fun as that would be, I really <laughs> they can really turn it into, a, into, a, my email. <laughs> into a defense stream. Yeah, we would have a very entertaining, um, a very entertaining moment. Akerfu asked, "Did you learn uh, neural nets at Harvard or on the internet? And if so, do you recommend sources?" Well, so that's a great question. Um, I have kind of done a little bit of both, uh, to be honest. So I've actually, I'm currently in a machine learning class that does cover some neural network stuff. Um, I'm also dealing with like, how do, I, how do I learn this on my own? How do I go in Google Papers? How do I kind of look around and try to find things um, that are interesting, I guess. Um, so I've kind of done a little bit of both. It's a pretty cutting edge field too, so I imagine like, there's a lot yeah. of new stuff coming out every day. Yeah, yeah, and it seems like almost every day there's like some new like mind-boggling, you know, idea that comes out. Um, all right, I think I think you'll wanna you'll wanna pull this up. 
Colton, this is pretty nifty. <laughs> oh wow! Um, <laughs> look at the look at what they did to my eyebrows, man. You have some I've got, aggressive eyebrows. I have got now. a I've got a goatee going too. And a goatee. That's a that's a strong goatee. We look pretty cool. I low key look um, like I also I uh, started aging. Like I have gray you in my hair. You are a little older. Um, it's kind of like that you know smokes a cigar kind of older. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, like a, It kind of looks like you're like ready to get. It's or like or neat. like a uh, like the like a what's it called? Great Gatsby style, like the long yes. cigarette. Yeah, like you're one just of those. Kind of like looking at your green light over in the corner. I just need a Stand suit, and then I, I can star <laughs> in the Great Gatsby. You you look actually pretty similar. I do. Your, you can your, definitely tell that I'm me, yeah. um, which is cool. You I don't have any that. like major changes, I don't think. <laughs> Um, you do look like you got a nice clean buzz going on the right yeah, side. Yeah, I got like a much sharper fade apparently. It's a green buzz. Um, yeah. Oh, so yeah, I, so I, things, had, I can't always see these colors. I don't know if you had to um, pay extra wild. for that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is oh, one of the kind of like yeah, beautiful um, applications of style transfer is we, we took this kind of original image over here and we applied it to this image, uh, our content image over here. And we ended up with this just wild application of that style. That is like the coolest thing. Like yeah. that is like the sickest thing. I can, can we, sit there and do this all day. Can we do another? Uh, let's do another one yeah, and then just like let it cook for ten minutes. Yep. I don't even know if this actually took ten minutes. I think it might have. Maybe just, they. Maybe they. Uh, they kind of say ten upper, minutes. Maybe just in case they, they get like a high server load or something, they want to exactly. like ballpark it. All right, so let's pick another image. Do um, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, people saying Brad Pitt, George Clooney. <laughs> those are very nice compliments. I appreciate that. Yeah, appreciate that's, that. Uh, that's pretty neat. <laughs> All right, what image are you thinking here? Uh, uh, like another stream image, or do we have one from another separate stream? Yeah, let's do another yeah. stream because that uh, one we've already we've already up. seen that one. Oh, whoops! There we go. Go through all your private files. Yeah, we're gonna just kind of skim through everything that I do. You know, like, <laughs> um, so we have these ones. Oh, I yeah, tried those, to like pick okay, one that was. Okay, we'll do that. It's not bad. One where you see have a, you look like you're facing the screen. This one, I'm just like, oh wow. Yeah, things. you're very intent on the. Yeah, talk. I'm like just staring you, at my You computer. are doing. Yeah, that one looks pretty cool. This one's okay. I don't know I what, you're throwing up a one. hand signal. I'm not I, sure what that is. I don't is. know what I'm doing. This might be like <laughs> messing with people. Oh, and we can upload a style. Oh, that is the sickest so, thing. So okay, so this has turned into a straight. We will get to TensorFlow, I promise, like a little bit. But like, <laughs> all right, this is too much fun. What's a cool style to throw on this image? Uh, um, oh, can we do sprite art, like you said? Yeah, is actually, that a, yeah. Is that a thing? That definitely could be a thing. Um, we're gonna make it a thing. Well, let's get maybe like two sprite people together. Would that work? Would yep. that solve okay. it? Okay. Sprite art, two people next to each other. I gotta, you gotta love search engines. Like, I can't yeah. imagine what this would have been like. There's beforehand. a lot of cartoon ones. There are some like cute cartoon ones. I'm not seeing any like immediately I don't see obvious. Sprite art though. Okay, I keep scrolling a little um, bit. We'll kind of. Let's see. Okay, there's this. We could throw a teenage mutant. Teenage mutant. <laughs> but would it work? Um, would it like? Would it screw up the fact that like uh, I'm we're occupying super down to find out? Yeah, let's try it. But we're occupying like different spaces, you know? Oh yeah, completely so different spaces. So I don't know if it's gonna like have like the turtle in the background or something. Oh, this is gonna be this is gonna be wild. Um, or it'll be completely disgusting. I also appreciate um, all the the like. I know you said you like to mess with all your settings, but like all the color changes you made to your whole operating oh, system you, and all you. your programs. Yeah, the whole thing is just very custom. Uh, very customized. But you said you're red, green, colorblind, so you can see the red and that. Uh, yeah, so the red on its own is okay. Um, and oftentimes, like, different hues of color uh, kind of modify. Oh, they changed the time estimate. That's kind of neat. Uh, we, the different hues of color will modify for me, like, what things blend with each other. Uh, video games tend to be very problematically hued because they're all the same hue. Right. Um, and, so, and they're, like, exactly the same hue. So then, like, red and green then just blend entirely. Um, so I actually, for like Call of Duty and stuff, I have to change my settings so that it's like Deuteronomic and then it's like blue and orange. And that's super easy for me to see. It must um, look to like other people. Oh, it looks wild, wild for other yeah. people. Like people will see it and they're just like, what is going on? Like that <laughs> like, is this so must weird. Be hardcore. Yeah, like, they're like, cause... what settings do you have on, you know? Um, Don't mess with this player. <laughs> So it's very interesting. Yeah, so we'll see what that ends up being. Um, and we'll kind of continue talking about this sort of thing. About nice can, you, uh, king of can you save that image and then send it to me? The, yeah, the yeah, I, uh, I think I did save it. Let's, let's go see. Let's go see if I actually saved this. I will totally make that like the screenshot for this stream. That would be super cool. Um, here, we'll save this image as, uh, let's see, style Nick Colton. Did it make it? What's the resolution it made it at? Did it make it That's at a decent great resolution? Question. Because uh, the base resolution, I think, is pretty low, right? Yeah, the base res was like whatever I screenshot at. I can upscale it if I need to. This is, you guys are seeing what goes on behind the scenes. We're really just like very entertaining. Oh, with it's 700 by times. 300? I can upscale that. Yeah, not I bad. think. Not that bad. should be fine. Or I'll put it like in a small section underneath like a title or something. Yeah. That'd be cool. 
Anyway. I love how, like, OS X flips the, the matrix representation, right? Like, the, the width is on the um, kind of first, or sorry, the height. Yeah, width is first and height is last. Oh, I really don't like oh, that. Oh, I feel like that's um, normal. I feel like my, so I'm used to, like, the matrix representation, right? Oh, Where it's, sure. like, height, uh, width, height yeah. and then width. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I don't think it'll end up mattering, but it's kind of entertaining. You spend too much time in that machine learning class, way man. Way too many machine learning class. That really is, like, just a fact. Um, <laughs> we spend way too much time on our P-sets at all times, um, and it's, it's killing me. <laughs> But it's so, okay, we're almost done. So the image is cooking now? The, well, the, I haven't reloaded the, the page, so let's, let's see. It is, oh, did, but did it say it was going to email you in like 11 it minutes does, or whatever? So now it's 10 minutes. Okay. So it is actually probably a realistic estimate. So yeah, we'll hop into some tensor, TensorFlow. Uh, JP guys says solve some P-sets live. Um, no, no one would want to see that. Uh, my professor <laughs> two, would two birds get ad done. It would be oh, two birds you would, done. You would get ad would get that, ad is for that. that is a fact. Uh, it's a little rough. But it would be, I think, very fun. It would be very time effective. Um, yeah. and you guys, I'm sure, would know it. Produce enough content to, like, <laughs> and solve problems yeah, and at I the same time. Homework, complete your degree. Um, all in one go. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to hop into some TensorFlow stuff. I was originally going to code, and then I got to today, and I kind of looked up, woke up this morning and was like, yep, I do not have enough familiarity with exactly what I would want to code to code this. Um, so we're going to borrow someone, a YouTuber that I also watch. Uh, he does a really great job. His name is, I think, Siraj. Raval. I'm so sorry, Siraj, if I just <laughs> butchered your name. I'm very apologetic for that. Um, but he has this really cool library, uh, or not really library, but just kind of like a GitHub. Um, and I would definitely recommend checking it out. Very, uh, it. very appropriately named for the stream today. Yeah, he uh, literally titled it what we were going to do in the stream. So, you know, You're uh, like, hmm, this looks like standing it might on work. the shoulders of giants and all that. <laughs> And he does a really great job with all sorts of cool things. Um, and I would recommend watching his YouTube show. Um, but here's the guy's name. He's really neat. Um, if you see this, Siraj. How to do style uh, transfer yeah. in TensorFlow for Nick Wong and Colton Ogden. Yeah, that for next us. Episode he just missed you know, the CS50 rest of it. <laughs> live. Um, so we're going to hop through his uh, iPy notebook because it's kind of neat. And he, he has all sorts of cool stuff here. Actually, I'm going to hop through a couple oh, parts of this. Oh, does iSpy so. notebooks actually get rendered on GitHub? Yeah, they do, which is Whoa, wild. Whoa, that that's um, blows my mind. It's it's pretty neat. I, I'm not going to lie, GitHub does all sorts of cool things. Go Microsoft. Jeez. Um, so he does kind of like a brief explanation of how this works. Um, and then he picked Willy Wonka. I think that's great. Um, and I'm going to hop down to the loss functions. So, okay. So there's a lot of TensorFlow-specific stuff uh, going on here, um, which is kind of wild. But um, TensorFlow, if you're not familiar, works on these kind of sessions. So I start some TensorFlow session, and from there I can then add like variables to it. I can add layers to whatever's being run. I can add a model to it, and like there's this graphical way of displaying models that's super useful um, in ML. Um, and so if you're not familiar, topological. Uh, graph of convolutional neural net. These topological models for how like a neural net might work, these aren't really what I'm looking for. This is probably closest. Um, so these topological models are really useful for knowing what things depend on what other things. Um, the Whoops. <laughs> surprise, we're also still jamming out. Over I here. need to turn that music off. Um, this is maybe a little go. too complex. I don't know. There's like, I can't think. I can't find like the ideal thing for what I'm looking for. But I know I've seen it in several papers. Like the image that I have in my head is very different from what is being currently displayed. Um, we could actually we could stick with something like this, and it works close enough. Um, so essentially, if you're familiar at all with like topological sort or topological graphs, um, they're essentially a way of representing dependencies and what things rely on other things in order to work. Um, now this seems to lend itself pretty reasonably well to a neural network which processes from one to the other end and has several things that rely on the things before them and possibly after them. Um, so in a neural network, this uh, topological graph is kind of made more complex by the fact that there's a back propagation step which effectively inverts the graph. Um, so essentially, and back propagation again is like teaching the network. Right. It's uh, after I've seen what I know, or after I know what I've seen. Hmm, that's a weird thing in English. After I've seen a bunch of stuff, um, I want to then learn from that experience. So I put all that learning back to where all the uh, kind of learning happened. And the next time I see something new, I learn again, and I can kind of continue this process until I've learned. Um, that sounds useful, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> the True Kinesis, I think, has posted the book, uh, the Bishop book on machine learning several times. It's super useful. Would recommend going through it. We use it in our class. Um, it is just out there in the wild. 
Um, they do a really good job of explaining a lot of stuff. Doesn't require too much math. Um, so thank you for posting that. I mean, I say it doesn't require too much math. It requires a decent amount of math. Um, I take that back. It's like pretty, pretty heavy on math. You would want some like solid linear algebra, solid cal, uh, yeah, solid linear algebra, solid calculus, and solid uh, probability theory. All of three of those kind of come together in machine learning, and generally in CS, you'll want to know all three anyway. So it's useful. Um, for programming, you don't necessarily need them, but for computer science, you'll definitely want them. Um, so yeah, there's this kind of like way of organizing what's going on in a neural network, and that's kind of the one of the premises behind TensorFlow's um, idea. Now, TensorFlow is named after what's called uh, like these tensors, um, so kind of matrices of data, and tensors are kind of the underlying just base primitive of everything in TensorFlow. Um, every layer, every weight, every input style, every output result, they're all tensors. Um, and the idea is that once we have this kind of baseline primitive, kind of like a matrix is a primitive, um, then from there, or maybe a matrix is like a complex primitive, but whatever, it's close enough um, for what I'm trying to say, which is that tensors are the kind of uh, bread and butter of TensorFlow, um, which shouldn't hopefully come as a surprise given that it's called TensorFlow. Um, so it's a so like, flowing is another part of the the flowing is the rest, um, which is basically that we take data and it flows from tensor to tensor wow. um, and goes across. Yeah, it's kind of the intuitive <laughs> explanation uh, behind it. <laughs> um, and essentially, what we want to be able to do as we interact with the TensorFlow session is we create these sessions using like TF dot session or TF dot interactive session, um, and then they have an internal representation, a graph of what exactly is going on in your machine learning. Uh, it's very worth playing around. There are millions of tutorials, probably millions, literally millions. Um, um, of tutorials online on how to like get that going, and it's really entertaining. It's super interesting. It's very educational, and as kind of Colton's been doing, it motivates learning all of the math from the top down. So once I get things working with kind of my TensorFlow stuff, then I'm going to say, okay, how, now I have a reason to learn all the math. Otherwise, it's very it tends to be very boring to learn. The math. Yeah, it's a, it's interesting. Like you can do a lot right out the gate with all these libraries that people have come out with, yeah. but it's incredibly hard to like know what to fine tune if you're exactly. kind of in the dark like I am because my math. <laughs> background isn't as strong as uh, most Harvard undergraduates. Right. <laughs> well, I don't know about most, but definitely was... there are people here who they know a lot of math. Um, like They're like math Olympians and things, and we're just like, oh, wow, that's neat. Um, <laughs> they're, they're very impressive. Um, I'm not one of those people, unfortunately, but I do know a decent amount of math. I know enough to get by in computer science, so eh, here we are. Um, and I'm still learning more as we go. Um, but essentially, this, this, there's this underlying graphical representation of what's going on. Um, TensorFlow has all sorts of like libraries that interact with it that let you print these graphs, let you see what's going on, visualize it, um, which is super useful if you're doing what's called network diagnostics, where I want to understand a little bit more about, excuse me, how does the graph uh, work? You know, like where are things going? Where are things headed? Things like that. Oh, so it'll actually um, print out like a. It'll actually generate a graph yeah, for you. Yeah, there's a. Let's see. Because that's actually really sick. TensorFlow visualize um, graph. That actually. Um, so TensorBoard is the actual library for it, um, but it lets you do things oh, wow. like this, um, which is super cool. So. And this just it gen generates it based on the model that you've created. Yep. In yeah. Code. It's super helpful. Uh, there's also orange machine learning. This is not at all TensorFlow, um, but it is a graphical way to do all sorts of, let me find some screenshots. To oh, show it's off. like a visual like neural yeah, network Yeah, visual neural network, visual machine learning, uh, visual data analysis, and like wow. data sets. Okay. Um, is, and this, I, is this open source? I believe so, or yeah. Maybe not open source, but at least maybe, free. Yep, open source ML and data visualization. Um, wow. And so I had a student in CS50 who asked me if I knew this uh, software because she was working on it for a final project. And I was like, no, I don't. But I'm happy to sit down and kind of like debug a little bit with you. That looks really cool. I would be nifty. super down um, to look at that. Also, yeah. shout out to David Malin in the oh, chat. Hey, David. <laughs> for the folks that are tuning in who might not be familiar, David teaches CS50. So again, go to yep. youtube.com slash CS50. Check out the lectures there. Super awesome lectures. Yeah. Um, pick 9117 asked, I heard there's a winter in AI slash ML funding. How true is that? Well, so essentially all of those like kind of, I'd say like clickbait almost um, ideas of like, oh, they have no funding slash all the funding is there. Um, I think it kind of depends on where you are in your uh, research and what you're doing with your research. 
there is to a degree, from what I'm aware of, I know that funding is just difficult to get in general. I also know that as we expand into like the kind of wider variance parts of each of these fields, it becomes a little bit less, uh, I guess, simple to get funding for the general field, but maybe for what you're doing, it might be very easy. Um, it also depends on like what you're classifying under AI ML funding. Uh, Kind of depends. Um, I would say that, as with most things, there's a lot of nuance to it. And it's like, if you're here and you're working on research for you know, the med school and they're the ones that are kind of providing your funding, that might be a little bit easier. If you're working for the US government, then it might be very easy if you're in California and you happen to be like Tesla or something. But if you're working on like a very small personal project or you're working on a project that's like very cutting edge like theory, um, and it's not necessarily going to produce a product, then the government might be, I mean, they might be even more inclined to help you, they might be less inclined. If it's a military project, it's probably very easy to get uh, funding for ML style things. A lot of them are using that in their, a lot of military applications for AI and ML have been kind of published a little bit, but probably not enough. Um, if you were looking at like the Google kind of contract for, um, excuse me, uh, the Google contract for working, or I guess contracting with the military on an AI project and Google backed out and there's all these things going on. There's kind of like just a wild world going on in there and it's, it's pretty complex. There's a lot of stuff happening. Um, so I would say that not necessarily a winter so much as things are happening and AI, like funding is hard to get. <laughs> like it's, you know, it, and again, that really depends on where you are and who you are um, plus what you're doing. So that's kind of, not really an answer so much as like a, it's not necessarily an answerable question. Like I can't say yes or no. Um, I one, don't know enough, and two, it, I would imagine it's complex enough that there isn't just a simple yes or no answer. Um, if you'll notice, I kind of accidentally pulled this up. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. That so did not have the result that I expected it to. Did not quite do what we were expecting. Wow. I feel like we're going to kind of just do this in 10-minute intervals throughout the stream. We can see um, that. I, I guess to see my face. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, our faces you are still have there. evolved My face into something gone. completely I'm a out of this universe. Human being right there. But uh, uh, <laughs> it looks like it like chopped up the turtles into like a <laughs> bunch of pieces and then used that as outlines. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what. what <laughs> I love and, that the fifty faces, is still there. Um, our faces, yeah, the fifty got turned into turtle bits. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, that was. I think I see like turtle faces, like smiles, like, a, 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 oh, as yeah. your eyes even. I'm not yep. even sure. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm on another planet. It was a good effort. There. It was uh, a good effort. <laughs> it, I don't know if we want to do like a, uh, like that's definitely the troll outcome of today's podcast. Yes. Or, uh, today's uh, yes, episode. It is. But um, if you want to maybe find a different style, we could try and. Uh, I'm sad that we couldn't find like. Like, let's look for a style with like two people, two other people, and then mix style. that with us. Or 8 bit style works too, I guess. I kind of want just like the abstract 8 bit idea. Oh, sure. Um, rather than, like, I need something that's like a full texture, like kind of like that. Oh, yeah, um, like an 8 bit, yeah, full, yeah, yeah. but more color than blue. I need more just, than just, just be that blue, color, yeah. yeah. Or even um, like this would be maybe okay if it was just one of us. I, I want like the just 8 bit pattern. Studio Ghibli says Sarul, which is actually pretty good. That's like, it's, it's, it's anime, but I'm not sure if that would. That'd be kind of neat, though. It'd be pretty cool. I'd be kind of down to see if You'd I have could... to find a good picture of uh, yeah, a I need, couple like, people. People. Studio Ghibli people it might show you like the director and stuff like that. Oh, true, true. Um, um, well, there's, there's a couple. This Let's one see. might be kind of neat. That'd be, that'd be wow, dude. That would be frightening. I think. Um, I think this try is it. Try. I don't know. <laughs> it's gonna be weird, but it, it could be good. People are gonna watch this stream in like a year or so and be like, "What were these two doing?" <laughs> What was this is. Nick Wong do? You know, because you you don't have really a whole lot of choice here. Like I'm kind of like just throwing things at it. So you have like uh, benefit of the doubt, you know. Like <laughs> people look into this, they're like, "Oh, he didn't. He wasn't trying to do wild things. He was. He was trying to do normal, reasonable things." This Nick Wong dude is just crazy. This um, new, well, I mean, people know that. I, they, I just love that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I was doing then. Like this. <laughs> oh well, maybe I was kind of doing that. You know. <laughs> uh, that I, I have total such meme. confusing hand signals a lot of the time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's okay. Um, in 10 minutes or so, we'll check back in on this, see what happens. It looks like CSOD um, has evolved a good bit since I took it. Really cool to see you have a channel on Twitch now. It says Hambone Hey. Awesome. Thank you very much sweet. for tuning in. I'm glad. Yeah, it's evolved even since I took it. And that was only, only two years ago. Or so. Yeah. Um, Adding new stuff all the time. Yeah. It's how, um, we, it's how we roll. It's been evolving quite a bit. Um, and I'm sure it'll evolve even after this iteration. Um, it's evolving literally midstream right now. Yeah. These amazing images. <laughs> it's wild. Uh, the, uh, I really was a fan of that first 
the style transfer. The first though. one was awesome. I that think that was looked... that was kind of just like a one hit masterpiece. Ah, uh, right so good. Nice, yeah, nicely done. Um, this one was uh, no. Yeah, that was like a rebellious phase. You no, know, like we, no, we were teenagers. Yeah. It was kind of wild. This is when we were kids and we that just was followed smooth. the rules. It was smooth. Very it was well really done. good. This one. It's like your 20s, you know? You're just kind of wild. We'll see what happens. Um, we'll see what happens. All right, so let's look at these loss functions. <laughs> um, so we create sessions um, in TensorFlow. You don't have to worry too much about them. They're worth kind of understanding intuitively. It's kind of like just your uh, current TensorFlow idea that's going on. Um, so it's not, not too wild. But the way that uh, Siraj built these was to kind of like figure out the loss um, given some set of layers that we want to look at. So if we we'll remember, some layers are better for style, some layers are better for pulling off features that are more related to like the content of the image. So that's essentially what um, is parameterized here is we have some session, some model, so like the VGG16, um, the content image. So this just takes in some image that we're uh, trying to pull content out of and then it grabs the actual IDs of that layer. Uh, and this is very well documented and very well done. Um, is there like a good starter tutorial for TensorFlow that people that we could like point people yeah. to? Um, linear regression in TensorFlow. Also, Jason G, thank you for the shout out. <laughs> What's going um, on? So here's something that I would look at. Um, let me find. Yeah. So this the like Geeks for Geeks site generally has some like decent tutorials on just kind of basic uh, concepts. And they go through some of the math, which is pretty helpful. It's a lot of that kind of like mx plus b, uh, y equals mx plus b sort of thing. Um, and this is for linear regression, so it's a, it's a little far removed from neural networks, but it still has the same concept where I define some function, I want to fit it to some data, and that fitting is really a measure of how close I can get in terms of loss. Um, how, how close am I measured by this loss metric? Um, and they, they do a pretty good job of kind of going over some basic TensorFlow stuff. It's probably a little bit outdated, but it's still the right idea. Um, and you get used to these kind of like TensorFlow has like these placeholders, constants, and variables. I'm too used to um, TF, meaning teaching fellow. Yep, yeah, yeah, you got to get used to the <laughs> TensorFlow, uh, uh, what is it? I can't remember, acronyms here. Um, and they go over some kind of the like basic ideas of how this works, getting used to doing some math with TensorFlow. Um, and then if you go to just like TensorFlow's, oh my god, I can't spell, TensorFlow's documentation. Oh, that was something I was Googling earlier. Uh, TensorFlow's documentation is pretty thorough. Um, they do a good job of having some like tutorials for how to go. Um, in fact, their like introduction to it is definitely pretty solid. I wouldn't necessarily mess around with the JavaScript one or the mobile IT, IoT one. Um, but if you look at just kind of like the general like TensorFlow, they have it in all sorts of different languages, um, and they have some like decent examples for just simple stuff. Um, it's really kind of a matter of like, there's many different things that as you get used to this, you're getting familiar with. Um, so this is actually a neural network. Uh, this uses kind of just like your standard Keras API. Um, so this is very high level, very little math is required but you're building some form of network that can optimize for, um, I think in this case, classifying your MNIST, so your data set on digits, handwritten digits. Um, they do a really good job of explaining like the different kinds of things you can throw in here. I would definitely stick to like simple stuff at first, where so take MNIST, do all the different things you want to do with it, um, and get used to kind of the, how does TensorFlow work? What is this kind of TensorFlow syntax? How does TensorFlow's kind of conceptualization of things work, what is their kind of mindset. Um, it's pretty pretty thoroughly well through, um, done. Their documentation is pretty thorough. I'd recommend following through that. And then from there, once you kind of understand what's the like idea behind TensorFlow, how does TensorFlow work, things like that, then it's really reasonable to say, okay, now in general, what am I trying to do with machine learning? How does machine learning work as kind of like a concept? And that's where like the theory is super useful because as an abstract idea, math is really useful for expressing these abstract concepts. Um, so that's where you might look at a textbook and say, okay, um, linear regression works like this. It's something I'm familiar with. It's relatively easy to understand. And then I hop into something like perceptrons or neural networks or uh, supervised learning versus unsupervised learning or classifiers versus like predictive spaces and things like that. Um, versus like sequence prediction and LSTMs and all of those things kind of start to just kind of like fall out into like you can just learn them. Um, the idea that I would say is like 
follow a textbook and implement stuff as you go in like TensorFlow or PyTorch. Um, give yourself that kind of practice as you go while still learning the theory, still learning the abstract concepts, um, and don't like learn them separately. Um, I think that that is kind of one of the issues with how this is often, I guess, taught, is you're taught just the math and then like told to implement stuff. Um, and in an academic setting, in like, a, in like the school setting, that works pretty well because you just have P-sets that ask you to implement these things um, in real life. And that, that I think is pretty reasonable. But I think if you're learning on your own, it's really difficult to motivate um, learning things. So if you just treat the entire textbook like a P-set and try to implement everything you see or just kind of like main concepts as you see them, it tends to be a really informative exercise. You start to see exactly these kinds of patterns and how to actually use the syntax of TensorFlow, how to use the syntax of Python even, some tricks with like NumPy and visualization, and you start to kind of like branch out as you go, um, guided by the textbook, which was put together, understanding that abstract ideas can kind of flow between each other. Um, so yeah, I would recommend kind of like following that pattern. It's fairly reasonably similar to what we do in school, um, except we're guided by someone who is an expert in the field as well. Um, and that's an extra advantage just from being in a university, is someone who can kind of be like, well, this is the right direction, this one might be, you'll have some roadblocks that you might not have expected. But I think that in general, that's pretty useful. Starnard says, yo, hello, Starnard. <laughs> yeah, hello, Starnard. What's happening? Uh, we haven't seen you in a little bit. It's been a while, um, it's been a minute. All right, let's see. Did it, did it uh, finish I, I'm up? I'm really curious. Oh boy, here oh, we go. Oh, well this was. It's a little strange looking. <laughs> Interesting. Wow, I look so, uh, your face got smashed in. Like yep. your chin is just. <laughs> it's just gone. You're, um, uh, they put a lot of emphasis on your hand there with the. Uh, yeah, we're, I'm not sure what you got. I'm not sure what you dipped your hand into, but something. I don't know. And then um, uh, my it, jacket is still pretty. It, it, this 50 Nicely is later. The 50 never going. goes away. 50 nope, is it's a strong permanent. feature, I suspect. Yeah, it must just, well, because it's got this curve here and then a nice solid curve here. Plus, everyone's pretty solid at learning MNIST, so. Yeah, I sense. like the uh, I like the coloration that happened on my face. It looks like I got like a really strong makeup, yeah. uh, like a lot of makeup and yeah, like uh, exactly. rouge applied to me. They threw there. eyebrows just onto your eyebrows. Um, <laughs> they, they did. I have <laughs> extra the, eyebrows. I have four eyebrows. <laughs> um, and then you don't have eyes anymore. No, no, I just have dashes. Actually, you um, look like you just ate like the sourest candy. Yep, so sour taste. that like part of my face <laughs> Went back inside. Like you your know? like your jaw like um, melted, yeah. literally. <laughs> and my ears kind of changed shape. Um, that's that's a new one. Um, the spider <laughs> is definitely not not bad. Um, yeah, I mean even JP guy JP guy saying there. this was better than Ninja Turtles one. I agree. True. Yeah, there's no chop. It's not like we stuck the turtles in a blender and then threw them at the picture. Like, <laughs> yeah, that is than what that. happened. <laughs> um, I have a hypothesis that we could do something like. Um, galaxy image. Also, flying sea pig. Hello, what's up, guys? We're just doing some yeah, we're just style doing, transfers. We're doing some style having some having there. a good time, good and bad results. Oh, Definitely galaxy! A mixed... galaxy transfer would be really sick. I really want to see what happens if we transfer like a nebula onto ourselves, like this. That would be sick. Do it. So we're Let's gonna find out what. We're gonna have to rename this stream. Just Nick looks and Colton, like see Club. what they look yeah, like it does. In, in new. It kind of does look like we realities. just beat each other up quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I kind of like got your chin. You got my side of my face. It's, it's a wild time. Oh wait, I can just pick from my. Bla photos. Oh, the black hole transfer. There's that too. True. We might. Although that image isn't very high resolution, it isn't is not. it? It's pretty low. Um, at least not in like a. Not we could do like a sense. we could do like a fictional black hole, like an artist rendition, you know. True. Yeah, and, and I think that would like be kind of super neat. high resolution. But let's do the nebula first. I think that one. We could also even transfer cool. onto the black hole, right? Uh, oh, I like how the time keeps going up. They're like worried that I'm. You know, yeah, not yeah. <laughs> they think you're up to no good. Um, all right, so we're gonna see what happens with this. Neutron oh, man. star. There's no way this is gonna be. I, I don't know. I'm I'm curious. I think it's gonna um, be all right. It's gonna be better than the Ninja Turtles. I think we oh, can yeah. agree on that. Oh yeah, that was that was a lower bound. That one was. Um, uh, neutrons <laughs> are pretty neat. Uh, I don't think we oh, have any yeah. real images. Of oh, them, do though. the two neutron star. Do the the, or, the double. Is yeah. there a double one? Yeah, that, that oh, one right there. One? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right, then that we'll throw that in there too. You know, we can <laughs> we can do multiple at once. I think that'd be um, sick. Actually, I'm gonna be blue. You're gonna be red. Oh my gosh, that's gonna be wild. Get this all day, like you said. Yeah, I was gonna say we could have an entire stream just on this and like seeing what happens. <laughs> yeah, this is delightful. So this is actually way better than doing P sets. Um, for anyone who's curious on like my opinions on whether or not I would rather do this for two hours than uh, do like stat homework, um, this this is this is more rewarding. Uh, oh, can you transfer from one stream pick to another stream pick? That's true. We did need to switch the stream picks. We could do that. Yep. Yeah. 
Oh, well, in that, if we're in opposite positions, we'll swap presumably our faces onto each other's faces. Um, oh. Which is... Oh, is that what he's referring to? I think to? that's what they're referring that to. That would be sick. Yeah. So we'll, we'll try that, yeah. too. We're going <laughs> to... Deepart.io is going to kick us off. Um, I'm positive. We're going to just get... Connect. But um, we're... Oh, that was a new word. I've never tried that word before. Uh, <laughs> just making up words over here. Um, yeah, we'll see if this submits. Might be might be struggling a little bit. Or we'll submit it like 400 times. Um, good. Oh, well, I guess it's deepart.io de slash hire was where we were for a bit. Um, they, they're on to you. They want us, yeah, they want me they to know, work for them. They want my math, strong math background. Exactly. I have a very strong, and, uh, <laughs> the, the strongest math, math background at Harvard, <laughs> without a doubt. All right, so we're going to, I kind of, I like this image quite a bit. Um, and then we're going to, oh, I just tried to submit something that had nothing on it. Let's grab another, um, do, 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 do. okay, so I'm on the left on that one. So we're going to have one with you on the right. My face looks a little okay. I look less derpy in this one. I'm just <laughs> when you take to random samples, dirt. you're bound to get That's like. That's true. I have to spend time scrubbing through the video to find where we don't look <laughs> derpy. Don't look silly. Like yeah. both of us. Like there's like oh, yeah. it's a it's a multiplicative thing. Like because at one moment you might be looking derpy, I might be looking fabulous. <laughs> and you're looking fine. And vice and versa. I'm, you know. Yep. That's a wild time. All right, so they'll be done in around 20 minutes. Oh, um, did you put three? Hey, how many of those did you put? Wait, oh, what? well, we have uh, quite a few of these ones going. Wait, what? I think I might have clicked that a few too many times. Um, okay, interesting. Yeah, this is, this is Nick learning how to use the internet, um, which is apparently a struggle. Does I might Harvard, have clicked it like 40 times. Does Harvard have a separate platform with OpenCourseWare like MIT or is everything on edX? Uh, I think everything's on edX. So Harvard everything X, that we've published. Yeah. Harvard X, to my knowledge, is our open source version of that, and that, that all goes on to edX. Yeah, MIT's open courseware program is really good. They and it's all on YouTube, job. so it's like super yeah. nice to just get easy access to it. Easily and then, accessible. They link to all of the actual like course documentation, so if you need the notes yeah. or the slides or what yeah. have you. It's all very easy to get. Yep. Yeah, and I, I saw that we kind of triggered like a stats discussion in there, um, and people were like, wait, is stat really that boring? It's actually, I don't think it's that boring. I think it's just that uh, the stuff that we're doing is, is pretty hard. <laughs> like, I, it's not that I'm bored, it's that I'm struggling to like figure it out. Um, I, I don't think I've ever had a class here where I'm like, wow, I'm so bored, this is too easy. I've almost purely had classes where I'm like, holy God, please help. <laughs> like, um, there's a lot of jokes. I think one of my friends and I, we looked at the commits that we made two years ago to, on a project that we worked on together. And, um, and she's a really good friend of mine. And like, our, this is like how we met each other, was like, they're working on these projects. And we committed at 6 a.m. Um, I committed the phrase, I am useless. And then she committed something like, this still doesn't work. And then I submitted like a commit that was like, oh, it works now. And then she goes, good job. And then we both committed something like right after that was like, does not still work. And then she goes, we did a terrible job. <laughs> and that was the state of the class. Like that was just how that course went. Uh, it's taught a lot better now, <laughs> but people still feel very, very sad during the course. Um, it, it's pretty common for people here to be pretty, pretty, uh, we'll say, challenged um, or, or sad during a lot of these courses. <laughs> They're, they're generally pretty difficult. Um, I, I have yet to find a boring course. It would be kind of nice, actually. <laughs> It'd be easy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I haven't taken an easy course in a long time, uh, basically since high school. High school, everything was like so nice. Everything was very reasonable. They gave you so many little worksheets. You could just like fill them out, you know? <laughs> and then I got here. It's like, oh, no. Miss elementary school? Yeah, I really do. <laughs> like Elementary school was like, hey, can you fill in the blank? And I was like, yes, I can. Now they're like... The whole page is a blank. You fill that in with uh, your essay. <laughs> I'm like, no, I can't. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, you know, that's uh, that's how it works. We can, we can definitely say that uh, TensorFlow does not skimp out on the commenting, or at least this repo. Yeah, does not no, skimp uh, out Siraj on the commenting. comments all over the place, um, and he does a really good job of like trying to make sure you know exactly what's going on. Um, like so, this yeah. whole program, all it does is print "Hello World." Like, yeah, we haven't even <laughs> we're, no, that's exactly what it does. It's just, <laughs> well, no, no, he does a great job. Um, this loss is so essentially what he does is uh, here. We have, in order for you to feed an image, like a single image into TensorFlow um, during like a single session, you need to create what's called a feed dict. And it essentially just is like, what tensor are you trying to throw through, the, uh, through TensorFlow? So that's just kind of like a formality for TensorFlow. But he gets these layers, um, which is kind of just like 
the layers themselves, um, the tensors that represent the filters for each layer, so each convolutional layer, and it's the layers that he picked. So it's given this kind of like range of IDs that he wants. Um, I think for content, if I remember correctly, he only uses one layer uh, because there's like a single layer that grabs the content pretty well, so there's no need to do any others. And then he runs the session on the one image, excuse me, the image that's being thrown through, uh, that content image, and tries to figure out um, what values you would get from that. Um, and then he runs just this, uh, this with model.graph as default. He's using an interactive section, so there's actually, I don't think, a need for that. Interactive sessions set the default to the like current graph as is. There's, this is something you would need if you didn't have that, if you were using just a normal TensorFlow session. Um, and then from there, he computes this total loss by taking the mean of each of the individual losses between layers. So for each layer you picked, find out the loss. Um, and the loss in this case is actually fairly tractable mathematically. It's just your mean squared error. Um, so you just take the difference between the two, square each individual difference, um, and then take the average over all of the differences um, in like a matrix. So if I had two matrices, kind of I imagine it as like overlaying them, and that overlay represents the delta between them, the difference. And then I square each value, so I do like an individual wise square, and I take the average, and that average is an individual value. Um, then he takes the average over all of the layers that he has computed this loss for. Um, and this is the content loss. So it's a very kind of straightforward loss function. It's not too terrible. Everything's just kind of like as is, it's linear, or well, actually in this case, quadratic, but it's not terrible. It's very commonly used. Um, and then from there, we hop into this uh, slightly more complex loss for style. Um, so style is a little bit more difficult to represent how far away we are from something. Um, style is a little bit more abstract. So content's pretty easy. Does it have a circle? Does it have a square here? Does it, you know, and so on. Um, is it the right color here or whatever? But style is challenging. How do I quantify what style something is? Is it the colors? Is it the way the colors are next to each other? And if that's the case, how do I measure that? Um, and so what ends up being done here is using this Gram matrix, um, which is essentially, uh, he talks about it a little bit um, in his stream, and I think he goes through it pretty well. Um, but you can think of it as like a variance slash correlation matrix. Um, it's pretty commonly used in math for certain applications. I don't know it super well. Um, but the idea is really that the best kind of way of explaining a style of an image is by looking at its variance um, and properties of that variance therein. Um, so that sort of thing is, e even that isn't necessarily the best way to quantify style, but it is a very good one that works um, in practice. So then he essentially does the exact same thing here, um, where again, we take the mean squared error of the gram matrix version of each layer and the value that we got um, by running it on each of those layers. Um, so not, not too terribly complex in terms of loss. Um, things could be very, very crazy. There are fun loss functions that are wild, um, but these ones are pretty simple, um, mean squared error and you kind of just descend across those gradients. Um, the rest of this is really just kind of like the, or sorry, not the rest of this, but after the style transfer algorithm part of it, the rest, and kind of in that, it's really just a neural network. Um, we just kind of like go down through, we get certain values at each layer, and then we figure out the gradient and prop that gradient back through the network and then repeat. Um, and that's what the style transfer part does. Um, he kind of initializes each of the losses. Um, there's the uh, mixed image that you'll remember I mentioned where you throw in a kind of image with some sort of noise on it. Um, and he has another loss function for that. Um, this is just going through and saying, okay, um, essentially, what are the different noises um, that I've encountered across, and just the bigger they are, the lo bigger the loss, so you're minimizing it. Does that noise image go between the style and the base image? Uh, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, yeah, basically, because um, you're kind of adding features from both the style and the content into this noised image, and you're then looking at the difference. Um, I see. And you're trying to minimize that such that they're all, like if you imagine like styles over here, features over here, or sorry, contents over here, and then like noises in the middle, you want it to be like perfectly balanced in the middle, but you want that distance between them to be like minimal as possible. So actually, maybe a better way to imagine this is like style, content, noise is up here to start, and I want to minimize this vertical distance while keeping the horizontal distances the same. Uh, more or less is like the concept. Okay. I want to keep it balanced between those two so that I'm not picking up content from the style image and I'm not picking up style from the content image, but I want it to be as close to them as possible. Um, and that essentially is, represents the same image um, for both. Um, and I would imagine that that concept can be applied pretty, I haven't looked at any research on this, but um, my guess is there's probably some paper written on something similar where 
how do, how do I look at like distance slash similarity slash averages um, that are meaningful, uh, different from like the arithmetic average between like three images or four images or higher dimensional averages between different uh, images. So I think that that would be really interesting, but it's also just not necessarily exactly the same. Uh, like what if I wanted like um, certain kinds of content from one image and certain kinds of content from another image and then certain stylistic parts from one image and certain stylistic parts from another um, might be an interesting application of that. Um, let's take a look at our submissions while we're going. I would imagine that like it has to take it probably drives more shape features from the base image than like coloring and maybe um, like color differences between pixels. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, usually it should. Oh, wow, that's cool. um, there's a lot of like interesting ways that it gets applied. That's kind of what I expected. This kind of makes sense. We look kind of starry and celestial. Uh, the like like our looks and kind of physical shapes are unchanged, but the kind of color pattern on top has differed. Um, and it looks very much it kind of looks like a grid like if you were to just like poke a bunch of holes in us, but yeah. it also very much has that kind of celestial patterning. Uh, kind of like here around my ears over here. Your entire face has some celestial patterning. That, um, this is just this is just the base image. Yeah. Yeah. No, no yeah. changes. With uh, very minimal changes to like the actual, uh, we'll say like features. Uh, so then we'll kind of keep scrolling up and see what happened. Did okay. The, uh, this is this is kind of interesting. Um, okay. There is some of that distortion due to this like oh, transfer yeah. effect between the two of us. Interesting. Um, it didn't have the effect that I was expecting. Yeah, my face melted. Uh, it did. Yeah. Yours got like a laser scar. That's kind of neat. Yeah, it did. And then it looks like there's kind of like an almost this like red shadow on uh, each of us. And then there's blue uh -huh. kind of in the middle. Um, you, I definitely did take more of the blue when you took more of the red. Yeah. So there is part of that. So there is kind of that element to it. I was hoping um, that my entire, like, I would have become entirely <laughs> blue, blue. And then you would have become red and then we would have had like a light thing like a between light. us. Yeah. It did not neat. turn out exactly how I not expected quite. it. Not quite. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that's interesting here is you can almost, you can start to infer what the uh, neural network was inferring as far as style goes. What was important to it as style. Right. Um, and not everything that we think is stylistic is stylistic according to the neural network not everything that we think is content is content according to the neural network yeah and that's kind of the interesting part is where does and it those are those divide? are the, that's the latent space aspect of it right yeah. and that's the new thing that i've learned like the latent variables right. that we <laughs> things can't that we see, don't observe but, but the computer infers knows. by looking at the data yeah. so many times they, they right. it sort of bubbles <laughs> up those things bubble up yeah it's a very interesting um idea oh this is wild this oh is did whack. it actually not oh it didn't really well <laughs> you look a little bit different you look, yep. you look younger. You look like uh, yeah. You look like you might be like eight years old there. Yep, that's a little weird. And I, you don't look too different. I don't look to that much different. Yeah, uh, no, it's you kind just, of a little bit you, blurry. Yeah, you, know? you just look different. Yep. So Slightly this is different. kind of an interesting combination. Uh, it kept the feature of my shirt, <laughs> it mostly did. I guess because it thought that was super important. I wonder um, if you were to run that for more iterations. Like, does it stop at like? After the max number of iterations, it thinks know. it's capable of like changing. It might, yeah, it might measure like some measure of loss and looking at whether the loss changes significantly from one to the next. It might also just cap its number of iterations so that you don't accidentally get malicious inputs. Sure. Um, that like keep it running forever. Um, I don't know necessarily how DeepArt.io does their neural networking. Um, but my guess is it's some parameterized version so that they're not burning through too many resources. We're still doing better than Ninja Turtles, though. Yes, Ninja Turtles was low. That was a global it, minimum. Was... Um, we minimized there. <laughs> that was, uh, we optimized hardcore on that one. Carlos, um, hello. This is hi from Portugal. Hello, good to see you, Carlos. Yeah, so I think I think my favorite is this one. It's this still one, that one, and that's one of the default one. styles. Like now, should we be yep. looking for something that's that dramatically stylistic on Google, maybe? And like probably find, that's probably like let's like their uh, maybe their the, algorithm is also very tailored to certain C, types of images. C, C painting Japanese. Oh, that's yeah. Such a, you know yeah, what I'm talking about? Yeah, like exactly. The, I know exactly. Yeah, yeah, wow. And Google did do too. Do it. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Let's find a Throw it in there. Throw it in there. Yep. We're this is gonna be. Oh, this is a high quality one. This is gonna be so good. All right. Oh, that might be a function of it. Does it the higher quality make that a difference? That might matter, yeah. But I know, I saw this in class once, um, not here, but in high school. My, uh, my high school teacher talked about it in a literature class. And I remember saying something that I thought was really silly, but then the more I thought about it, I was like, actually, what I said kind of made sense. Um, and it was just kind of like an interesting concept um, to look at this painting and really think about, you know, what does it mean, what things are... What things stand out in it? So I don't know. It's stuck in my head forever. We'll see what things stick out to the computer. Yeah, I'm really curious to see what the computer does to this. 
Um, hopefully, it will not be a complete abomination. Um, I, I have high hopes for this I, one. I think this one will work. I think that's the concept. The right? problem, you grab though, with style. I feel like the problem is that the wave feature is going to... Right. I, because of how different it is from the background, I think we're going to see some of that come into play. Well, so we really hope that the way that this neural network is designed is it really does grab stylistic features only. Yeah. Because um, if it does grab content, we will end up with a weird blend across us, um, and that will be a little whack. Like, you'll notice that, like, the shapes are all retained because yeah. content. I just but love how they were just wild. chopped into pieces <laughs> and just, like, thrown and, and then, like, like, turned into rearranged outlines. Rearranged correctly. That is, I don't even understand. That's pretty wild. Um, yeah. So, like, the content really shouldn't change too much according to how this should work. But should is a very strong term in computer science. <laughs> Yeah. Things should do what they're supposed to. But um, Can you beat the wait time with incognito? I imagine it's a server load thing, right? Uh, yeah, they might just not. Like, it might literally just be like, a, we don't have time for it. Or maybe um, it's an IP based thing. It could be. I mean, we could verify that by kind of going. Although you have like an account almost. Um, oh, okay. You got like access to this, this through a code that they sent me through email. So you have a session. You couldn't, yeah, there's yeah. like a session that's going on with this, so it probably wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be too easy. It's okay. It gives people a reason yeah. to stick around. Yeah, right? you guys there's... are hanging around. You want to see, you know, <laughs> what's going on. Um, plus, wouldn't... I think it's worth you know kind of waiting through. It helps us pace the show. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit. Uh, I saw someone was saying I feel bad because people, um, you know, they work so like professors and academics work so hard on these like corpus or textbooks. And then people look for cheaper, free alternatives. Um, I think that there are kind of two ways of looking at that. I think there's kind of an optimistic and, from a student's perspective, way of looking at it, where, honestly, I think if I wrote something and people were looking for cheaper, free alternatives, um, then that means that I've reached an audience that is so desperate for what I had, what I built, what I wrote, um, that they're, they're just trying to find any way to get at it. Whether, like, they don't have the ability necessarily to pay for it, and they're just looking for any way to get it because whatever I built was so valuable um, to them. And, and to a degree, I think that that's really awesome. I think that if I was trying to make money off of it, then, okay, that might suck. Um, that's terrible. But I don't think, I think from a lot of professors' perspectives, and I'm not a professor, nor am I really an academic, so I guess I can't speak to what they're doing um, but I would imagine that from the way a lot of them act and the way a lot of them have chosen to make careers, they're teaching students. Um, and they're teaching. They're, that's their whole thing. They're teaching. They're researching. They're trying to contribute to the like, scope of human knowledge. I don't think that the motivation is really financial. I think a lot of these professors could go work in industry and make a lot more money. That's not their point. Their whole point in being here is to access as many students as possible, to influence the way that they grow up to learn things, and to put information out there for them that is valuable just for the sake of the information. Um, I know a couple of professors who've written open source textbooks. You can go and contribute to them if you'd like. Um, and their whole point was, you know, uh, one of our professors wrote like a 400 textbook, excuse me, like a 400, 500 page textbook. And it's open source, it's on GitHub, you can contribute to it. We all downloaded it for free. Um, and his whole point was, it's, it's there to educate you. Uh, he's not making money off of it because he doesn't need to. He's not trying to make money off of it. So. I think that there is kind of a, I don't know, there's some, there's some nuance to that. I don't think it's necessarily terrible. Um, there are cases, I think, where it is terrible, but maybe the reasoning behind it being terrible is terrible in and of itself. Um, I think there are some professors who are always trying to make money off of their textbooks, off of their students. And maybe that's necessary, given their circumstances, and there's a lot of nuance there. But maybe it's not necessary, and they're just doing it for the sake of extra money. And I don't know, that might be... Uh, I have some questions for that. <laughs> in our economy, I think textbooks have skyrocketed in price over the last yeah, like, 10 years, though. Um, Maybe and 10, for 15 students, it's pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, like they have like $100 or $200 for a lot of textbooks. Yeah, yeah or more. Um, so I don't know. It's, uh, it's a little interesting. And I know like CS50 doesn't even use a textbook. So. Yeah, we don't. No, we, uh, yeah. we just lead people to. We, we have recommendations. That's true. It's some like, recommended reading. We produce so much content, I think, that we try to fill that gap. Yeah, through video <laughs> and audio as much as possible. Yeah, so there's all sorts of interesting things um, with that. And I don't necessarily have like a strong opinion either way, but there are other ways of looking at it as well. Um, right, so we have these kind of loss functions. We've defined all the ways, all the things we're trying to minimize. Um, and the true can says, is there a site that contains short summaries of everything humans know? Um, I like Google. Yeah, uh, Wikipedia, Wikipedia's one. Wikipedia's Wikipedia's not bad too. <laughs> Yeah, um, and so then if we look through the style transfer algorithm itself, 
you'll notice that it behaves very similarly to our neural network idea. Um, there is some syntactical difference here because it's TensorFlow, and it's a little bit easier for us to read and understand at a higher level rather than just like pure numpy matrices. But there is this still, you're iterating over some number of iterations. Um, we have our image, and that, that's what we're going to feed in. Um, that's what we're going to shove through our network. Um, we have some gradients, some like adjustments based on whatever we got out of our network, and then we run the network based on our image and the uh, like tensors and layers that we wanted from uh, the network to run it on. And then he does this np dot squeeze. So I, I just always think that's the funniest name for what's going on. Is they're they're just trying to like. If you have a bunch of extra dimensions going on and it's like this higher dimensional object, you can kind of just shut it down into a smaller object. Um, it, it's just kind of a funny name for what it says. It makes perfect sense, it's just weird. Um, and then they do this kind of like, how much do we actually want to move in any one direction? So kind of your learning rate. Um, and then you update the image that you're trying to produce. This is the output image by whatever your gradient was. So this is the change that should have happened. Um, and by a multiplication of like that eta, that learning rate. Um, and then from there, we do all sorts of things to like verify that it's in the right ranges so that it's still an image. Um, from here, it's like, uh, oh, sorry, I highlighted the wrong thing. Where am I trying to highlight? Oh, sorry, this is just the end of our iterator is here. And essentially, you then just repeat that process. So you'll notice it's still very much this like gradient descent, neural networks, back prop a little bit, um, except a lot of that is now hidden from us. So it's a little bit easier for us to kind of understand everything as it goes. Um, and it takes fewer lines of code, which is convenient. Um, and you can generalize this code fairly easily. You can pick multiple layers for grabbing content, and that might help you. You can pick a couple of layers. You can pick, uh, in particular, like certain layers. You can change your learning rates. Um, it's a pretty easy to follow along with example um, as far as like how you would learn this. And then he runs it on, I think, one particular image, this one. And here's all the parameters. You could pretty easily transfer those into command line arguments and run it as like a command line tool. Um, and then he goes through and shows all the different uh, versions. I don't really personally see, oops, see a huge difference between these two, but I see a pretty impressive difference between these two. Um, and you'll notice that like these two are off, like the, the weights are really not that large uh, in difference. So like they're still the same order of magnitude. They're not off by a whole lot. These ones are off by a little order of magnitude, but still about the same. So that's that um, middle, yeah. Same. So that's that noise layer, and so they're, that's yeah. the, they're putting their both of their values into that, like you're talking yep. about. It's kind of like pulling con our content from the left, sticking it here, and then pulling our style from the right and sticking it over top. Right. Um, and to say over top is a little bit of a oversimplification, but it's the right idea. Um, and then I don't know why I pulled these open. I think I was going to go talk about them, but that's about right. Um, so there's this other paper that is on archive. Um, oops, uh, why is this open? Uh, there we go. And this paper also talks about how to understand kind of the artistic style of a given image. Uh, what is the kind of idea behind the way that it's styled? And again, it's a fairly, it's a very abstract idea. And it's pretty difficult to quantify, if not impossible to really purely quantify. Um, but this paper, again, not super long. It's only 16 pages. Um, you'll notice that they have um, pretty much the same uh, set of images as in this one. Um, they go through it a little bit differently, and they talk about different things. Um, I actually am not a huge fan of the way they, like, literally just the way they formatted their paper, but it's OK. Um, and this is just kind of another way of talking through kind of what went on in this other paper. Um, but this is kind of the one that I would use if I was trying to, uh, like, if I was going to cite something, and this is maybe something I would use to understand it a little bit cleaner um, as things are going. They, I believe, talk through the same exact things with just like a little bit of difference in what exactly they cover. But it's roughly the same concepts. Um, like I think these guys just go a little bit more in depth. This paper is much better styled. Yeah, and this is more like an ACM mod style. Like the other one looks mod. like it was just a high school paper. This one looks like it's legitimately yeah. like. So this one's on archive. This one was actually time. published. You know, there's, the there's some pretty major differences between the two. Yeah. All right, let's see. I really want to see. I really do too. Have... The wave, yeah, the wave art. Oh, oh wow. it, it grabbed some of the content though. Yeah, look, but oh, kind of cool. <laughs> look, look at your text on your shirt though. That looks so cool. That's nifty. They um, they really did end up styling your text there to look like waves. Oh, that's neat. 
That's um, sick. Yeah, so they grabbed a little bit of content, but mostly style. I look like an undead kraken mo like, Yeah, no, like it's like your skull is here. I'm we both look sure, like skulls. But I'm pretty like, sure I'm just like an undead water monster. That's wild. And then you're phasing in and out of this out of this world. Yep. And you have a sick water shirt. <laughs> I've got my nifty water shirt on. I'm ready to go take on Poseidon, you know. I and need then... to make that like my profile picture or something. <laughs> We gotta, yeah, there's all sorts of cool things. That is we so could sick. literally play with this all day. Not Hands look like chicken legs, yeah, actually. A little they bit, yeah. Do. It also kind of looks like maybe, like, either you're putting on, like, your aquatic glove yeah. or your skin is melting off. I do look like uh, a skeleton. Uh, like, little skeleton. Uh, that's just, like, seals it even more. Kind of this part here, you got, like, some teeth going on, like, yeah. eye sockets instead of eyes. I look like I'm just the water monster. Like, yeah, I'm, you've I'm got, like, made you've got water. Cthulhu, like, little mini <laughs> yeah, Cthulhu got, like, tentacles, tentacles coming out of your face there. Out of my face. This is wild. This is going to show up on some weird Reddit somewhere. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> almost positive. Yeah, this um, is amazing. I feel like I should post that somewhere. <laughs> Shove it up on the... <laughs> Nick's <laughs> popping a water balloon. Kind of looks like it. Yeah, yeah a water balloon a with, bit, like, with, like, my text. I'm yeah. just, like, confounded at how this it styled that text. That's so cool. Like, it legit styled that text like waves. The, the like whole idea of style transfer is just mind-bogglingly awesome, um, which is why we wanted to do a stream on it, and I'm glad we did, but it's just so neat. Like, <laughs> you're really seeing like our, our real like, interactions with this, because um, we, we don't plan these things very, very much. That's very cool. Um, and I mean, from like a machine learning context, it would be interesting to see uh, what would happen if you pick different layers, right? So this probably picks some set of layers um, if it's really crazy clever, then maybe it picks a couple of different variant layers, like it picks a couple of random handfuls of them, and then it says which ones minimize that loss. But it might not even do something like that. It might have a set number of layers or set layers from the uh, network that it's using that work really, really well. Um, but it would be interesting to see what happens as you change layers. And that, of course, would be the benefit to doing it yourself, to implementing your own version of it. Yeah, because um, here you're kind of locked into whatever their algorithm yeah, is. Yeah, I don't really server. know how their algorithm works. Um, but building it yourself would obviously give you that ability of like parameterization and tuning. Um, we just didn't Might have, run a little uh, slower. Yeah, depending it'll on be how a little much slow depending on whether or not you have a GPU. <laughs> but still very interesting. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of cool stuff you can do with that. Um, I think we've we've run the let's kind of do like a brief scan through all of our old images. So pretty neat. I yeah, think, I think the artwork is what came off as neat. Yeah, it really took a lot of the the wave stuff, like the the foam, yeah. and put that into the image. I guess that was a pretty distinct feature. Oh, we got a lot of things here too. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm now just curious. Like we're we're gonna throw another one through this. Uh, I <laughs> can't spend, stop myself. Spend forever. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, this will be inter This will be. I think this would be pretty pretty interesting too. That one's a pretty. Um, I feel like that one is a pretty like generic enough style to where we'll see really good. I think a good yeah, styling of it. It should be a broad just encapsulation of the actual style. Um, because you really want to avoid having too much content. Because as much yeah. as it's trying to grab style, we're really just picking different layers, and they're all geared at like understanding, right? So it's really kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting idea. Okay, so we'll see what that does. What if you transfer just a blank <laughs> color background? Well, so if there's no color background, it should, in concept, learn no features. And that's true because it's not going to have any data. It's going to have no data coming in, and right. it's going to take the other data. But a blank color background, the different colors have different meanings. So white is actually a number. It's not zero. So zero has special properties. Like like zero and one and negative one have special properties. But like white is like two fifty five. It's a number that isn't like special. It has so everything no, like, is going to get like properties. lighter in the picture. Probably it presumably would do something kind of strange. Yeah. And then black um, would black not make everything darker? Like the white's dark. Presumably. Um, it, that would be kind of interesting. Um, Did you learn all this in a single course at Harvard or from multiple courses? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I definitely could not have learned all of this from a single course, even though a single course here covers just ridiculous amounts of information. Um, even CS50, which is an yeah. CS course, covers Our a lot. Our CS course covers so much information. And, and I think the, best, the way that that was best demonstrated to me was when I TF'd for the business school equivalent of CS50, we taught... I would say like substantially less just breadth of information and depth. Um, we covered a much higher level overview of the same concepts. So we didn't force people to work in like C, for example, at least not really. Um, and even in our Python stuff, it wasn't super intensive. There was nothing too crazy. Not that CS50 is like super intensive and too crazy, 
but it's pretty intensive and a little crazy. Like there's there's a lot there. And I had never really thought about or realized, I never really looked outside of Harvard to kind of see how other people taught intro courses or how these courses went. Um, and so seeing it taught at the business school and helping teach it at the business school was really interesting because it was different, it was very different. And the amount of information in it was a lot less um, in terms of like just how much pure effort and like energy and mental just like dedication was like kind of required and demanded by the course. Um, and that makes perfect sense given that business school students are not 18 with their only priority being college. Um, they have other priorities in play. It's There are other things at work. So it makes, I think, a lot of sense that that's the way it's done. And I think David's iterating on it probably literally as we speak. Uh, <laughs> and there's all sorts of things that I'm sure will change. But it was really interesting to see that because I don't. I think you get used to being here, the fact that that's how courses are taught here. They're just enormous quantities of information, enormous depth of information, and you're required to know all of it pretty much as if you knew it at like a fundamental level. Um, and so even our intro to like theoretical computer science, um, in a conversation with that professor, he was talking about how he's just so excited to teach us all these things that he essentially teaches just everything that he can find, um, which makes, I mean, in one semester that makes it pretty difficult um, as a student because you have you know four or five of these courses and they're all pummeling you with as much information as they could find but I think it's also super interesting and it um, it, it helps us I think a lot um, so yeah there's all sorts of things going on I think that even in a single course at Harvard it would be very difficult to learn all of these things because a lot of them come from just kind of learning on your own as you go maybe even just like your intuition or your own research, um, your peers and what they say to you. I mean, I hear about stuff from Colton all the time. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to go Google that. And I find out about it and I research what it does. Or like, you know, sprite art was something that, or even just like the whole like mindset behind video gaming um, as a design, as like a designer came from like talking with Colton and learning things from him. Because I had only ever played them. And I was a programmer and I like had played video games, but I had never tried putting that together. Um, and so there's like a lot of this just like, Finding a community that can help teach you about things, finding all sorts of like what you want to go do um, is really helpful. There's there's all sorts of uh, ways to go about it, but you know, and so it's just, such is life, I guess. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of just like I get curious about things, so I just go read about them. If I can't sleep, then maybe I'll just pull up, you know. Um, Whatever I was going to say. Uh, the internet. Yeah, I'm very tired. I'm like huh, slogging through words. I'm forgetting what I'm going to say. Oh, well. Um, yeah, so I saw someone was asking, like, when are we going to code? I have a feeling that the answer is we're not going to code a whole lot. <laughs> My apologies. Um, we could code through kind of some simple examples in TensorFlow, but I think it's a little bit more worthwhile to answer people's questions. So we'll probably not do that too much. Um, I want to see if this has uh, loaded yet. 11 minutes, so we're getting there. Um, yeah. But I probably have to be are, like in the next stream. I'm guessing we'll do yeah, yeah. a bit more of that. In the next stream, when I have more of a chance to actually sit down and kind of work on stuff, um, although I'm realizing that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have some difficulty planning our next stream because I'm almost done with school. <laughs> I'm almost oh. uh, off to California. Oh, actually. that's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, so next week, you're not going to be around. Yeah, so next week, I actually have a midterm. Um, <laughs> kind of ironically, on these things. <laughs> and then uh, the week after, do you know about the week after that? So the week after that, I think I have a final. Because <laughs> oh, then it's like finals week and things. So we'll have to, we'll have to we figure might, that we're out. We're going to have to uh, um, coordinate that, yeah. Nick <laughs> yeah. is a, busy, a very busy person. Uh, thank you. At the, end of a, at the end of a semester. <laughs> and this semester is a lot. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. Um, we end up getting thrown into like, all right, you got to pack all your stuff up. You got to literally pack up everything you have and ship it somewhere. Like, you gotta remove it. The, the houses won't let you keep it there. You also have to, like, I'm in the middle of trying to find thesis advisors and trying to make sure that I don't uh, kind of shoot myself in the foot for next year. And then we're also trying to, like, you gotta plan flights home, you gotta uh, wrap up everything with every class, so all my final projects, all my final presentations, all my finals are all in, like, the next three weeks. Um, and then there's all the like club stuff. So any club that you're in, any club you're running, you know, we're like electing people to our new club for things. Um, I'm finishing up all of our demonstrations for cybersecurity, trying to like make sure everything's set up reasonably well for the next year, trying to like get an idea of what things we need to set up over the summer, who I need to collaborate with, who I have to do stuff with, you know, things like that. Um, so it's really just like a last push, you know, you kind of just like, 
give yourself some chocolate at the end of every day and hope you make it. <laughs> Um, whatever yeah. gets you through. It, whatever, whatever works for you. Uh, some people do pottery. Some people eat some chocolate. I, I personally kind of just like sit and stare at a desk for a moment and kind of meditate. <laughs> Sometimes I do pottery too. Uh, or I'll sit there with like people who are doing things. Uh, like watch people play volleyball. I don't know. Whatever you can do to like take your mind off of the intense, just like crushing stress of whatever is coming at you. You get very good at it though. And like that's how life works kind of in general anyway. So like not too bad. Um, you get very used to it, and then you're not so bad. Um, I sleep quite a bit now, which is great. Like more sleep, very healthy. More yeah, sleep is good. good for you. Makes you not get sick. Stuff like that. Um, yeah. So essentially, uh, oh, that's a new message. Um, was not expecting that. Our what artwork is, is being painted. Is what that says. Oh, Sorry, it's, fascinating. Uh, it's okay. Midstream there. Uh, what kind of career would you like to pursue after graduating? Nick asks. That is the a JP guy. great question. Um, Bad so, Knight does mention you have a Google internship. <laughs> yeah, so I do have uh, Google this summer, and then it's fairly likely that I'll pursue working with them for a little while. Um, I think, to a degree, that would be completely the wrong choice for me long term. Um, to work at a major company for like a significant proportion of my life, like 10 years, 15 years in the future. I think five years from now, I see myself maybe pursuing more schooling, um, possibly getting a PhD, possibly getting an MBA. It kind of depends on where I'm at, I'm at in five years. Um, but then I think in 10 years, I see myself running my own companies. Um, what would you want to do as far as your um, own company? So I'm kind of stuck at the moment between kind of different things that I find super interesting. Um, I think the bioengineering, weirdly enough, on a computer science heavy stream, I'm, I'm actually primarily bioengineering. Um, I work mostly with like, you know, how do proteins work? How do you create like a genetic circuit? Things like that. Um, how do I deal with uh, technology integrating with the human body? And I think that that's where I'm really kind of fascinated is you know, some DSX type stuff. Yeah, kind of. How would I get us to interface with the internet? How do I? How do I directly access Google? How do I put myself online on a network? Um, or even simpler and maybe less far fetched, uh, how do I integrate like our neural system with something that is mechanical, um, purely mechanical? How do I make a biomechanical device? Um, how, how do you get synthetic limbs and organs to work properly? How do you get your body to not reject them? How do you get your body to interface with them? I, the way I kind of look at it is kind of like, how do you make an API for the human nervous system, right? Because um, that's really what an API is. And people, uh, I've noticed a lot of CS students now have kind of this distorted version of an API where they always think API and they always think like web API. Um, but the original API concept was not web-based. Um, it was an application programming interface where you take something very low level and you give yourself access to all of its features without having to understand exactly how it works. It's like game engines, um, like yeah, back in exactly. the day. Even still, it's still to and this it's day. still how that works. Like, that's still very common. Um, and oftentimes, libraries will be referred to as APIs because they are. Um, and so I think that it's very important to think, to think of it as like an adapter. Um, and so I think what would be beautiful is if by the end of my lifetime, I could create that adapter, um, but for the human body. <laughs> It'd be pretty sick. It'd be pretty awesome. Uh, I thought about that myself. I'm not into bioengineering, but I mean... <laughs> Also, that correlated with like replacement limbs and right. also like reverse Synthetics aging. And how do you prevent people from aging? Can I transfer someone's consciousness into all, something? That um, is the crazy stuff. And, and how wild. do you know they're the same person even if they claim they're right. the same person? Even if they say they are. And if I duplicate someone, you know, because let's assume you can transfer consciousness. Now, if I can duplicate that person's consciousness, is it the same? Or is that one person effectively? Once they learn something new, once they experience something different, are they now distinct people? You know, like, it, probably like the, yeah, all these probably questions. like instances of a class um, at that point. Yeah. yeah, are they instances of the person, and then that person is actually just an abstraction? You know, like, there's all these crazy ideas, um, and it's really difficult to kind of noodle on effectively without having it kind of exist. But I, I don't think, like, I think there are a lot of people, and there are a lot of scientists I know who would laugh at these kinds of ideas. They're silly. They're ridiculous. Um, to me, that means I'm studying the right things. I'm doing the right stuff. Um, if someone if someone older than me is laughing at whatever I'm saying because it's absurd, then I'm probably on the right track. Is kind of my bench my, my like rule of thumb. Yeah, um, like a ninja, ninja turtle. Uh, yeah, styles. like if it's kind of like. People see this. This is what they have in their head of like what I'm talking about, and this is what I could possibly create. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, you know, because that that is very much a naive approach. Um, and I've mentioned on this stream before actually that I have very much this naive mindset, and I'm going to take advantage of that while I do. You know, <laughs> like it goes away eventually. Um, I've been told. Uh, slash, I can see from just looking outside in the world, and uh, I'm trying to make use of it while I have it. But um, 
I don't know. There's all sorts of interesting things uh, going on. And to be clear, I'm not just blatantly ignoring the people who are laughing at what's going on. I, I think that they have a lot to teach me. Um, I just think that I'm not going to avoid something for the sake of whatever they think is silly. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there, There's a, something to be learned from making your own mistakes, I think. True. Um, there's a lot to be learned from that, actually. So yeah, uh, to kind of recap everything that's gone on on this stream so far, or not on the stream in general, but this particular stream, um, we've talked about style transfer. We've talked about a high-level overview of how that works. Excuse me. Oh, I messed with we have talked about a little bit of how you actually implement that, uh, relying on kind of the knowledge that we tried to build a little bit of last time, which is that if you're in a neural network and you have these layers that are communicating with each other, you're generating some sort of loss at each step, and you're saying, okay, I want to minimize this loss. How do I do that? And I look at the like mathematical derivative or gradient of that loss function, and then I apply that gradient um, after having learned something or after having seen some example back through the layers, um, and then I iterate over that process and I do it again. Um, with style transfer, it's a little bit different in that you don't have a data set, you have one data point, um, and you're not really like trying to learn necessarily anything from the data point. You're actually trying to push things onto the data point um, from the two inputs. And that's kind of a weird mindset shift, but it's if you look at it in like an abstract enough context, it's really not a mindset shift because we're still having these loss functions. We can combine them using a linear combination, and we're trying to minimize that overall loss function such that we obtain some meaningful result. Um, we use the layers of usually a pre-trained network in order to figure out which things are extracting like style features and which things are um, extracting, um, uh, I almost said underscored styled, I meant to say uh, content, the underlying patterns and ideas that we visually see, and you're trying to combine those in a way that is uh, a little bit more intense and nuanced than just overlaying the two images. Right. Um, to do that would be to just take an average usually or some form of average. That would, uh, look, maybe less that would look pretty wacky, yeah. It's a little weird. Uh, we actually, I think, did that on a stream a little while ago um, where we like pulled open every image and then just took the mathematical average. Yeah. Uh, we it, that it just looked like a blur. <laughs> Like we're phasing it. Yeah, out of we're just phasing through reality, um, which is really interesting. Um, you I want to preserve. You definitely want to preserve like <laughs> the shape of the content with the style. Right. Yeah, like the, what it needs yeah, to be exactly. styled. So what the contours are image. there? What things exist in the content? And then stylistically over that. And abstract concepts like that, they're pretty difficult. Um, but they're often the more interesting or very interesting concepts. Maybe not more interesting, but very very intensely interesting to us. Um, this page took too long to respond. That's unfortunate. And my artwork is still being printed. I really want that to come up before we end. We will not end the stream until this comes up. Uh, well, I, that, that's not a promise. I did not <laughs> promise that. Uh, we will hopefully not have to do that. Um, Bamak says, thank you for then. the awesome content as ever. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank, yeah, of course. thanks to Nick yeah, for, thank uh, <laughs> for showing us how style transfers work it. for a little bit of a tour of TensorFlow. We didn't cover a lot of coding today, but in yeah. the near future when we have Although another... if you look back in the past two streams, there's plenty of coding. Yeah, there was a lot of, <laughs> we did a lot of coding from scratch in the last couple of streams. We were, we were worried we were maybe losing people a little bit with uh, a little too much math. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you were losing me at a lot of, the, a lot of those pieces. So um, the K-Mean stuff... Understood all of that. K-Means was good. I 100%. think that was a good place to start. And, and then it was then, kind of like uh, a little bit of a rocket hop. To ap next, after that, yeah, <laughs> I kind of, kind of fell back a little bit after that. But yeah, that's okay. It's, a little, it's tricky. I I, mean, now that I'm messing well. with it myself in my own experiment, I have like, sure. the actual desire to learn how the math works so I can tweak it the way that I want to tweak it. Exactly. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see if we can get some, get some good results out of that. I don't know what your artwork is being painted means. I would love to know, though. Yeah, um, yeah it's a bit strange. Hey, oh, nice. Oh, wow. Wow. Dude, that is sick. <laughs> That's kind of neat. <laughs> I love how it, my hair is still preserved. Like, <laughs> Yeah, why is it that you you just have such a well-defined face that like I can still see your hair? Yeah. And your four, like, you, your forehead I don't know what there? happened to you, man. Like, that is, your head is gone. My head is not there. I look like a Some devil. of the logo got preserved, though. True. On your yeah. shirt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, the, the freaking text on my shirt got preserved in, I think, every example. My face, never. Never preserved. Uh, I want to use that. I want to use the. I want to use that as my too. profile picture. You are welcome. I'll send them both to you. Yeah, please do. That is sick. But this is this is wild. Although I, I, um, I think I might want to take a bigger picture and do it so that I don't have the watermark there. Oh right. Well, you can always like screenshot off of this, right? Like, you could kind of. Oh like, true. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I could crop it actually. I could, I could crop it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is so sick. That's neat. Um, yeah. So I think that's the that's the trick is you grab an art piece that is like stylistic as possible, you know, just yeah. pure style. Hey, you guys want to, if you guys want a new sick Facebook picture, like, 
Grab sure. a stick style. Just grab, grab a stick style, photo of yourself. Throw it on yourself. Make it work. That's, I think, possibly exactly what I'm going to do right after this stream. <laughs> <laughs> I had never really like tried this before. I just kind of like knew in concept it would work. Um, no, this is that is like a really cool this picture. This is nifty. Yeah, um, please do send that to me. Yeah, so I'll send will, it to you. I will uh, use that right as a Facebook this. picture. But yeah, people watching the stream who know me on Facebook, stuff. you'll see it happen. <laughs> Give me there. Yeah, um, would recommend playing around with these as much as possible. I think this is possibly the best one. I yeah. really like the cleanliness the, of the uh, first one. Yeah, the um, first one uh, and the uh, the water one was also pretty cool. Pretty I mean, neat. I ended up coming out of it looking cooler. I think overall because it, it gave me yeah, specifically it you. It kind of did a bunch of weird random stuff yeah, too because you, you look kind of blurry. You look I, like some I, like, I hardcore metal. I look you know, straight like. up like artwork. <laughs> like that looks yeah. like somebody created that. <laughs> 100%. That is cool. I think you just have a lot stronger and features. The, the in your water face, font, maybe? though. Like, how, how dope is the That's fact that, cool. that it made a water font? That out part of your is shirt. nifty. I would be interested to see if you could do this to, like, a font. You know, like, it, it did. Like, a font, uh, neat fonts. Colton's hair is always Where, perfect. Thank you, Natasha. I appreciate that. <laughs> Where, you know, you can take, like, actually, let's just take, like, Times New Roman. Times your own and make it water. Yeah, or like throw something oh, in shit, there. Oh, your uh, battery is. Did I unplug too, yeah. my? I think you did. Yeah. Of course I did. There we go. Um, I'd be really interested to see. You know, here's Times New Roman in presumably Times New Roman font. <sighs> Guys, we're never gonna end the stream. Uh, <laughs> hey, that's an assumption. You can't make an assumption like that. Yeah, I really can't. I mean, this. I'm not like an expert in fonts, and I know people who are, and like they look at something, and they're like, oh, well, obviously it's that. I'm like, what? The hell? You know, like, it's just ridiculous. Um, all right, so there's Times New Roman. Um, let's take a style that we really liked and throw it. Let's water. Uh, but we want people want to see about the water. I think the water was pretty dope. I think that was nifty. So let's let's throw that in there. Oh, what the heck? Oh, because it's black on no background. Right. I yeah. You, you might want to do a white background. All right. So we're actually just gonna screenshot that. Oh, true. You can do or that. Or maybe here we'll just grab do, this. Yeah. Perfect. There we go. Now, is it going to affect the fact that it's black text? Because yours was like white text. True. So we can invert this image um, oh, times two. True. And oh, this is a GIF. What? <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why would you do that? Uh, okay, this is presumably not a GIF. You never know, man. I really. I spoke. They're all. They're all. For they're some all reason. GIFs. That's so strange. I mean, I know I could like pull out like a individual image. Well, okay. So let's let's use some of our. Some of our powerful, uh, powerful image processing abilities through uh, DuckDuckGo. <laughs> uh, I mean, you could use a, uh, you could do a screenshot, but yeah, I, I don't really want to like take a huge. Just screenshot. take a screenshot of that. Yeah, there we go. This will work. <laughs> We're a mess. This is fascinating. Experiment. It really is. This is just kind of like an interesting idea. Tattoo ideas. They really are. You know, like. Oh, there it is. I was like, that's not what I wanted. Um, <laughs> All right, so we're gonna take this, we're gonna flip its color. Oh, now I, I said that, and then did the exact opposite. Now, I don't um, know for a fact if this matters. I was it just, might not. I was proposing it it's as just a kind of like possibility. a proposed yeah. idea, and I am totally willing to try out this proposed idea. All right. Just because so your, shirt, your shirt was black in the picture true. with white text. And we might as well normalize across as many things as we can, right? Yeah. All right, so we're gonna throw this new image through that um, as it goes. I'm positive deepart.io is like, this IP is doing weird stuff. <laughs> I don't know what they're, they're doing. Like, they're like, this IP is coming with some sick images. Cool things, Lick. but these two dudes are weirdly like, or this per, this IP is weirdly fascinated with these two dudes. <laughs> and then we threw text at it, like Times New Roman, and it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> like, that was that was wrong. Uh, All right, so let's, let's upload that screenshot, um, which I modified. Okay, so this is white on black. We're gonna use the same wave style. This is so cool, man. Like I swear, right, so you could make artwork. I mean, no wonder they made it a website that you can buy these from. I mean, of course they did that. Yeah. Um, that's perfectly reasonable. Shout out to whoever built this. <laughs> Very nicely done. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of cool stuff. There's, there's there's so many cool things and people out there and like, I don't know. It's fairly common for like our peers to be like, we're sitting here doing P sets when we could be helping contribute to like the wealth of knowledge that's out there. And you really have to just remember that like eventually, you know, like one day. Yeah. <laughs> that will be us eventually. Um, Getting all that knowledge surely does. Uh... Yeah, it helps. It helps in the long run. Like it's, a, it's the long game, you know? Um, but it's, it's hard to remember that when you're sitting there grinding through a piece set where you feel like an idiot. And you're just like, man, like how am I this dumb? <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Yeah. It's imposter syndrome, though, I feel like. It probably. is. It very much is. Um, there's very much a sense of that, and there's very much a sense of just, like, no matter what I do, I will always be three steps behind. And to a degree, professors kind of do that on purpose, I think. Um, kind of like a, a, little, a little bit of healthy competition, too. Yeah. And I think that's the other nice thing is I've never felt a sense of competition between myself and our peers. Like, I feel like we're all very much on the same page of, like, you're stupid, I'm stupid, we're all stupid, let's work on this stupid train together. You know, like, we're all just <laughs> struggling through. Um, and I think that that's actually been really healthy and beneficial, is you never feel like, I can't help you because then you'll beat me or you'll get something out of it that I don't want you to. It's, all, I've it's not like it's like a zero, never not, not a zero sum game. Yeah, type deal. it's very much, we should help each other because then we will both succeed. Yeah. And you very much learn this attitude of like, there's no point in not helping each other. Um, except when the ad board says you cannot. Um, oh, that's collaboration true. policies. There are certain certain you boundaries should follow. you cannot cross. Yeah. <laughs> follow the collaboration policy of your class. Um, although a lot of classes, especially in like CS and STEM, are like, meh, go ahead. Like, please collaborate or you'll all die. Like, Eesh. I hope you, you work together on these. Well, yeah, if you're in a project, um, though, in that, I'm guessing in that sense, yeah. yeah. Projects are usually pretty collab based. A lot of P sets are even collab based where it's just like, work together. Like, you guys will. You I guys will like lose your hair. It's if you nice because it's somewhat uh, <laughs> representative of what you might expect when you're actually working somewhere too. Right, right. And I, I always see these funny posts on Quora where it's like, uh, I have a coder who checks, you know, Stack Overflow and Google too often. Should I fire him? And every answer is like, Are you stupid. Like, why would you ever do that? Of course they're going to do I've that. I've seen That's that. Exactly how I feel like that. I've seen that post. I yeah, think it's there's a, a couple post. of them. It's very famous, I'm sure. It's a little wild. It's just so strange. You know, it's like really. I like, feel, well, I mean, that, that kind of signals to me like a disconnect between like yeah. hiring and your hiring and the manager and your coder or doing like, work. Exactly. Um, and it's really just like a misunderstanding of how that actually works. Well, that's something. Wow. I think you might have been right. Where Well, and I think this one had the problem of it couldn't pull non style because it had no background. Yeah. So it's black images on black. But also that, that black. R at the bottom is looking, and the O is looking pretty tight. These are neat. Um, the the couple of ones it did acquire, very cool. So I'm like hoping like the W, like that W at the top. Which one? This the, one? Yeah, that looks very pretty neat. cool. Very that like water, cool. you know, like it's just yeah. very. But yeah, the this background the things. background essentially just got stamped with the uh, yep. with the content of the original thing. Yep. Although it looks like it's tiled in a few places. It got kind of like thrown across it a few times. I think because there was no background. It, like in the in the content image, it, it had to fill no it content in. to pull. Yeah. So then any feature just would have gotten added on top. The um, I think we'll get better luck. Uh, well, we might get a little bit I'm of hoping, a mixed bag with I'm the curious. other one. I'm hoping that because it has actual pixels in the other one, whereas this one has just nothing. It's just empty space. I don't know how that gets computed. I don't know if they fill it in. I don't know how it works. Um, but let's see with this. I'm, I'm very curious. Okay, 12 minutes. Those estimates have been terrible. Um, in, like, the best possible way. They've all been just, like, super overestimates, and then they just kind of, yeah. like, get... get I have to imagine they do that just to save themselves if there is a massive amount of server load. Yeah. They probably overestimate by, like, a couple order of magnitudes. Um, they can just make money setting up an art gallery. That's true. I'm not going to steal their idea, though. This is all their idea. They did this. Um, DeepArt.io should take all credit for this one. Um, but... I'll, I'll be working on my own, my own companies over the summer. You know, I'll let, I'll let y'all know. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Um, it's up and coming. Um, but I think generally I'm mostly looking for experience and understanding. Mostly just trying to understand stuff. Um, but yeah, I'll actually, you know, probably over the summer, maybe I'll like do some like live streaming. Not nearly with as nice of a setup. You won't have like the the cool like overlays and things. You'll have just my face, possibly. It'll work, you, it'll <laughs> like, work your uh, way up. Yeah, I'll kind of like get there and then when I come back, audience, I'll rejoin. Finance a uh, an exactly. awesome or a little. Maybe background. I can like pull maybe pull some audience over the summer and then I'll bring that audience back on to CS50 Live. And yeah, hey, there you we'll go. Swap between the two. That'd, That'd be, be pretty sick. Idea. That'd be pretty sick. <laughs> do like a weekly stream of like. Daily, uh, daily thoughts. <laughs> just the just chatting thoughts. category on yeah, Twitch. Yeah, just cat. Just That's cat. what we're doing now, and it works fine. Sometimes yeah, it's, it's good, interesting enough. conversation. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, and we're also just trying to make time for. I really want to see. I'm really hoping. I'm. I have high hopes. This is like this the transfer. hopeful climax of the stream. Yes. Otherwise, we'll just very quickly cut to the bottom one. <laughs> Granted, oh, also the the like abstract one that you like the Picasso style right. one that you grabbed. I think that one's pretty awesome. That's not even. I don't even know if that's considered Picasso. I think but it is right. It's a uh, Picasso was cubist style question mark. <laughs> go duck. His was go. his was a uh, like abstract. Uh, he was all I sorts think. of things, but he was the co-founder. He probably of the would make something movement. like that. He probably would make something like that. Yeah. So here's some Picasso art, um, which is a little less. It's like kind of those like weird breakdowns of humans. 
And yeah. for a long time, I really just didn't understand why this art was interesting or like why it was complex. I thought it was kind of like a child's version of art. But I actually, through learning more machine learning, I realized why this art was so cool. Uh, or at least I started to gain an appreciation personally for some of this art because it's really, like if you ask me what are the main features of someone's face, I'd be like, oh, their nose, their eyes, their eyebrows, you know, whatever. I'd name some like physical features. And if someone were like, okay, I want you to take those features and I want you to adjust them in a way that's meaningful to you and artistically significant, but retains the core values of the features. And as like a human being, I might intuitively be like, oh, I can do that, you know, give me some time and like figure it out. Um, but as a machine, that's so difficult. Like, how do I adjust a feature without making it different from the actual feature? Like, that's just such a complex and nuanced idea. Um, and it's, it's too abstract, right? It's too abstract for a machine to do in like a, um, what do you call it? A uh, closed form or like simple, mathematically tractable way. Started and with saying there's a neural Gandalf that. bottom right. Is it really? Oh, yep, there you go. That's probably exactly that. Yep, new <laughs> algorithm. Picasso style makeovers. That's, that's wild. That's pretty um, great. I love it. Gotta love, like, I feel like the Picasso stylings over things are like the, um, it's like a test. I feel like Picasso would be pretty pissed, though. He'd be like, someone True. should make whatever He's they like, want. He's like, wait a second. I took my entire life and, like, tortured myself to do this, and you guys. Van Gogh, too. Van Gogh is, like, one of the first Picasso's to get here. their style um, used all over the place. The other thing I think that would be really cool is I'm really interested in, like, this abstract art. Uh, let me think, like, machine hard edge. Like, I'm looking for, like, this, like, repeating... Oh, let's do fractal. This would be trippy. Oh, like the Mandelbrot um, set? Or just yeah, a regular fractal? just, like, kind of arbitrary fractals and throw them onto these. Um, they're not... I think the hard lines makes things a little bit easier, but maybe, like, this style. Um, or polygon abstract art. So, like, oh, this sort of thing... It's similar I'm to sure what we like, did. It's similar to what we did the first time. Exactly. It's like, wide strokes. Yeah, very much, like, simple shapes. Oh, that's cool, too. This would be probably pretty nifty. I'm not downloading these for later, and then I'm going to apply them, but that's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, or you could do, like, low-poly is another form of this. Low-poly is um, cool. Low-poly abstract art. And so I feel like this would be yeah, super nifty. That would be really you know? cool. That would look really sick. <laughs> we're we're currently just seeing like my Facebook profile picture will be adjusted. Shortly. It's gonna be, it's um, gonna look pretty pretty sick though. It's gonna look very neat. I really want to change mine to that yep. one that you. Oh did. yeah, we will we will send those straight over. I also just like don't always remember like the names for these things, and I have to like always go through that process of like abstract art, cubic, hard edges, low poly, <laughs> and I like eventually yeah. get back to what I was originally using. These would be that, all very That nifty. would probably produce a really good one. I think this one will be cool. Well, we'll I have maybe to, like I'm going to do, this, I'm gonna do this too. Yeah. Yeah, my P-sets are just not happening. Um, tonight, <laughs> which is going to be a rough time. Oh, okay. okay. So this was... It's different than I expected. Very different from what but I was expecting. But you, you do get the water outlines around all the letters. Much yep. clearer than it's the other one. It's a lot clearer. Less, style trans or less content transfer from the style image. Um, wow. I'm kind of a fan of this W. Like, I think if it was cleaned up a little yeah. bit, this A is very, very yep. watery. Yep. The times got kind of blurred out by, like, this it glare. Did. It really um, did, yeah. Which is kind of rough. The, uh... But the N could be very neat. The W is really good. Yep. This M is not bad. The left of the M is pretty out. cool. It yeah. is a little washed out. The S, actually, I think we're under I think we're underappreciating. Mm, the the yeah. top of that S, S is, very is really solid. good. Very, the very bottom neat. of it kind of it's kind of like disproportionately thick in the middle. Yeah, yeah it got kind of like cut off here. But like if you were to like extend this kind of pattern all the way through, it'd be pretty neat. Yeah, uh, this is like there's something that you could definitely play around with um, throughout this. You know, yeah. like, there's all these ideas here that I think are just barely being explored. It works so nicely and organically on your shirt in that picture. Yeah, I know that was that was crazy. Like we're gonna just let's go back a little bit and appreciate that, and then we'll have to pop yeah, out. Yeah, we'll have to end it here. But. It just, but just look at that. That, just is, looks that so D. Nice. That is a beautiful D. Maybe it's the cursive style, kind of like and the o adapted too. the style easily. I don't know. Yeah, it's just this is actually the well Y done, looks really good too. Well done style transfer on text. Yeah, huh. that's insane. Well, I think as our last image, we'll throw the cubic art weapon back up there. You know what I should do is every day take a new <laughs> neural, image neural image and just new style and just and just change your Facebook picture like every week. Oh yeah, that'd be that'd be really. You could make an algorithm for that. I certainly could, yeah. just like code that up and just have it change your picture every week. I think I might do that. I might just I might just cool. I might just do like the, <laughs> the that new abstract one and then maybe like the 
I gotta find like a good base picture. Yeah, like, I'll probably and then choose just my iterate on it. I'll yeah. use my existing picture. I'll just change it every week. Yep, that's what's that's what's gonna happen. That'd be some wild like if you could add that as like a filter where it just takes that and throws it through this and does something. Oh, that like would that. be it. Would be so hard for uh, pretty hard for Facebook. Yeah. Though. That would be so expensive in terms of like. Yeah, Facebook would be like, yeah, you want to offer up the computational power? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You need a massive cluster to do that, like in exactly. real time. Like in real time, I don't know if that's real possible. Real time is pretty hard. They do this to uh, uh, videos too, where what they do is they take each frame yeah. and then they do it. That has but to be insane. The, uh, the tricky part is because each one is a little bit different. Yeah, it's actually you can get different, like massively different jumps. results. Yeah. yeah. So what they do is they add an, a fourth optimizer and constraint. They add a fourth like loss function. Like an interpolator. Function. It's like a, I think they call it like a flow loss function. And so it's the difference between two consecutive images has to be small. You're minimizing that difference right. as well. So it's, it is like uh, you just wait you're kind of like interpolating it. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, it's very neat. This one just turned out so well. I, I love this, this one, one so job. much. Like it captured all the parts of the scene. You got messed I got kind up of smushed, pretty you know? bad. Like my face got um, kind, of, kind of shoved down there. Yeah. But oh, yeah. No, that's okay. It's but cool. this was great. Thanks for yeah. thanks for the stream. And Thank we did you. do a lot of coding, so apologies for Sorry, the folks that were looking for coding. But we did cover a lot of interesting material. It was entertaining. Yep. Um, we got some great ideas. If you're looking for great ideas for your Facebook, you know, True. just hop over yeah. to it. What's the name of the website? Um, DeepArt.io. DeepArt.io. There we go. They do Check a great that out. job. There's all sorts of cool things up there. There's some other ones too, like I think like FastTransfer.ai or something. There's all sorts of ones out there, but DeepArt.io is the one I picked. That's just one I saw in some of the papers, so definitely worth looking at. Um, <laughs> Such cool things going on. It was here. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited, and I, I want to get better at the you know <laughs> generative adversarial networks for my own yep. nefarious Gotta purposes related to sprite <laughs> art. You know, so thanks to everybody who joined in to the stream today for watching this on YouTube after the fact. Uh, hit the subscribe button or visit yeah. us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash cs50tv. Uh, Listen to, to Colton and uh, David's podcast. Oh, true. Our, we have a podcast. CS50 Podcast is now on YouTube yeah. and Facebook and Google yep. Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify. Um, we're looking at Dang, other platforms. These are all over the place. We're trying. We're trying I to mean, spread the good word. In the best word. possible way. Like we're spreading the good word. We're, we're trying our best. <laughs> so check us out. CS50 Podcast, me and David. Um, it's about 30 minutes each episode. If you're, you know, uh, whatever major podcast platform you're on, we should support it. Um, if not, let me know. And Trukini says, Puppy Sounds on the next podcast, Colton. I'll take, a, I'll take a look at maybe doing something like that. We did make a reference to it, so I think it would be, I think it would be appropriate. So thanks again, everybody who joined in the stream. Um, join us on Friday, so no stream tomorrow. On Friday, we're doing another Python stream with me, nice. um, where we do the chat does the live coding wow, type thing. Wow, that's been going pretty well. It's yeah. been fun. It's been nice. fun. We've got a lot, a lot of people interested in it and taking part. So again, three Mr. Destructoids in the chat if you want to participate in that. So I uh, look forward to some of that on Friday at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the next week. We'll figure nice. out what comes next. <laughs> Sweet. Cool. Well, we won't thank see, you guys. We won't see Nick for a while. Yeah, so. I might be gone for quite some time. But so, um, I'll send Colton a link, and you guys can follow my YouTube channel, and I'll try and keep people updated during the summer. Yeah. You know, post like a weekly yeah, video. Yeah, follow or Nick on his stuff, <laughs> and um, bid farewell to Nick yes. for what might be yeah, a while. I'll see you all for a while. Yeah, thank you for the good luck with the exams. I'm going to need it for most of them. Um, <laughs> the exams will go as they go, um, but it'll be, it'll be a good time. <laughs> Star nerd, that, uh, the schedule being off a day is probably a thing with your time zone. It happens with certain people. Oh, that's it's, a, it's a crap widget, but it's the only one they have for calendars. So. Wow, that's wild. Unfortunately, we're going to have to deal with that. But yeah, it should, be, uh, should still be, if you shifted back a day relative <laughs> to where you are, it should still work. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there you go. But in any case, thanks so much to everybody who tuned in to CS50 yeah, Live. <laughs> Neural Networks Part 3, tune in in the near future, maybe, hopefully. Yeah, somewhere, distant somewhere future. Soon. Tier, we'll uh, have, uh, we'll have Gans up here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, make some, make some sick images of yourself with uh, deepart.io. Yeah. It's a good time. <laughs> Until then, stay safe, and I'll see you Friday. Yeah, good luck, guys. <laughs>